Good morning and welcome to the ESP tutorial of ASPLUS 2021. My name is Luca Carloni. I'm with the faculty of the Department of Computer Science at Columbia University. And together with the ESP team today, we are going to give you a, a pretty complete introduction to ESP, the open source research platform for agile system on chip design and programming. Uh, we have uh, prepared uh, a pretty dense and heterogeneous agenda for all of you, uh, which is structured on uh, a mix of presentations, demo, videos, and there are certain hands-on parts. And uh, so we will try to give you uh, a good introduction to all the main aspects uh, of uh, SOC design, programming, and doing research for, SOC, for system on chip using ESP from design integrating systems accelerator to integrate third party accelerator to design and test a many accelerator multi core system on chip design integrate accelerator uh, with um, high level synthesis and then we are going to have an example with one particular commercial high level synthesis tool design integrate accelerator for a particular application specific domain embedded machine learning and uh, um, we will start uh, soon with a demo on the how to use esp to do performance analysis of cache coherence for accelerator in a complete system setting and leveraging FPGA prototype. In the end, we will have some concluding remarks on how we uh, you are using ESP at Columbia University also for teaching, not just for research, and uh, the kind of material that we are providing and we plan to provide in the future to support uh, other um, teaching efforts at other institutions. The team today, uh, let me introduce it. Um, as I said, we are all members of the Department of Computer Science at Columbia University. Uh, and um, the team is a team of experienced uh, researcher who all contributed to the development of ESP in many different ways. Uh, I will just highlight a few things. Uh, David Giri, a PhD student at Columbia University, has worked on multiple aspects of both the architecture and the methodology, in particular on the design accelerators, and the design of uh, cache coherency models for accelerators uh, and uh, in, in various uh, ESP configurations. Joseph uh, Zuckerman, uh, also a, a PhD student at Columbia University. Um, he has worked on uh, particularly on uh, the memory hierarchy of ESP and uh, um, various accelerator modes the interaction uh, between uh, the memory hi hierarchy, the network on chip, and the processors. Uh, Giuseppe Di Guglielmo, an associate research scientist at Columbia University, he has worked on uh, multiple aspects, particularly related to uh, the methodologies uh, uh, for accelerator design with high-level synthesis, integrating also commercial tools, as well as modeling accelerators to simplify not only design and optimization, but also verification. Paolo Mantovani has, be, uh, has been the architect of ESP, um, and uh, has worked on multiple uh, parts of the systems, both in terms of the architecture and the methodology. And uh, as I said, my name is Luca Carloni. I've been doing research on uh, electronic design, automation, and embedded system and system on chip platforms for uh, almost uh, 25 years now. Uh, before we continue, I'll stop screen sharing to allow uh, Davide to. Uh, um introduce a, a few preliminary setup aspects for those of you who are interested in uh, particularly the hands-on part of the tutorial david yeah uh, hi everyone uh, you should be seeing the esp website um, this is where you can find all the information about esp and all the documentation i just want to walk you through where the tutorial information is you probably have seen it already under tutorials as plus tutorial. And I mainly want to point out that we have some preliminary instructions uh, set up for this tutorial. There's a couple of ways you can uh, do it. Uh, we have a Docker image, or if you had time to prepare more and you wanted to, you could have uh, installed the required packages and tools required by ESP on your machine or your server. And if you click here, you have the instructions. For example, for the Docker, we have instructions for uh, Linux systems or for Mac OS and Windows 10. Uh, mainly, 
the, the most important information is what uh, image. Uh, we also have the, the Docker image. We also have a smaller image if maybe you're only doing it now, last minute. This is a bit smaller. You can still do most of the steps. You just don't have the Rex5 tool chain, so you won't be able to compile software, but you can do the other uh, steps. Uh, then here we also have some instructions for this tutorial. Uh, these are only instructions for the sections of the tutorial that are hands-on, so the ones for which you can try yourself. And it's probably useful to keep these at hand on the side while you're uh, following the steps. So if you miss something that we do or say, you have, you have the steps here. And you will see that already in these first steps, some require CAD tools. You're not supposed to do those steps in this tutorial, although you can try afterwards if you have uh, those CAD tools and the licenses. So basically for all the steps where there's a CAD tool required, we will show it to you as a demo uh, and you won't be doing it yourself. So this is what the, the red things are about. And after showing you quite some steps of tutorials, then we will demo you how to do full system RTL simulation and FPGA prototyping. So this is just to point you to the instructions. And then while we're here, if you later, if you haven't already, you can take a look at the website. We have various resources, documentation with tutorials, a set of publications, tutorials, talks, uh, even some teaching section that can be useful if you uh, want to use ESP for a class project. So this is also useful as a little tour of the, of the website. Uh, this being said, I can give back the ball to Luca, who can continue the um, introduction. And of course, if you have any questions about the setup already, even during the presentation, uh, the initial overview presentation, feel free to post them on the chat. Okay, Luca. Thank you, Davide. So, go back here. So I, we introduced the team, we introduced the preliminary setup, so uh, let me spend just a, a couple of minutes on uh, telling you about uh, the motivation that led us to uh, develop uh, uh, ESP over the years. So uh, our research um, is and has been motivated by the consideration that um, computing systems are becoming heterog increasingly heterogeneous and therefore also increasingly more complex to design, to program and to validate. Um, this, is, we believe, happens across all computing domains uh, from embedded system all the way to data centers. And uh, one characteristic aspect of this increasing domination, if you will, of uh, um, heterogeneous computing is the role that the system on chip uh, is taking uh, across all sorts of computing systems. And so uh, when we use the term heterogeneous, uh, we refer to the fact that, uh, for instance, in a system on chip, uh, a system on chip consists of a combination of components that have different nature. In particular, there are components like processor cores, which are programmable. And then there is an increasing variety of uh, other components, which are uh, fixed function or uh, con slightly configurable uh, specialized hardware accelerators. And um, these accelerators uh, uh, often have uh, some of the most important aspects of innovation uh, of a system of a system on chip because they provide uh, high uh, energy efficiency and performance gain for key functions, for instance, like in this picture, graph acceleration or some a computer, computer vision algorithm or a machine learning algorithm compared to the execution of this function in software on a programmable component. And so uh, increasingly what you have is that systems are uh, obtained by composing uh, um, a variety of different components and in particular, some of these components are uh, um, increasing our, uh, components that are available from previous design as uh, a third party components or third party AP. And in these roles, uh, of course, very important for research uh, is the fact that we have uh, more and more components available also as open source hardware. Um, now, uh, what we uh, think is that uh, to uh, address the challenging challenges of uh, design and programming, the complexity challenges of design and programming system on chip, is important to have uh, um, an approach which is based on the concept of platforms. And as we will see in a second, 
The plat a platform is the combination of a computer architecture and a computer-aided design methodology. I mentioned open source hardware, uh, uh, as I'm sure uh, many of you know, over the last few years, uh, the open source hardware movement has been gaining momentum. Uh, many of us see it as an opportunity to re-energize the innovation in the semiconductor and electronic design and automation industry to promote research, innovation, entrepreneurship. Uh, there have been a variety of contributions in open source hardware from various institutions, academia, and industry. There are multi-institutional organizations that try to coordinate. Uh, there is support from governments. Uh, what uh, in this uh, landscape, uh, what we propose is uh, ESP as um, an open source hardware project that is particularly focused on the uh, concept of a platform to support system level design. So um, as you will see, ESP, which is uh, really the result of over eight years of research and as, uh, here at Columbia University and has become um, an open source project uh, since 2019, uh, ESP uh, offers a particular approach to uh, uh, open source hardware uh, because um, it, uh, um, it is focused on uh, integrating uh, third party components uh, with uh, giving uh, really the same weight, the same importance to both processors and accelerators, as well as to uh, uh, mechanisms uh, for uh, supporting the integration of process accelerator, like uh, the memory hierarchy, the network on chip. So um, everyone in the system, uh, in the context of ESP, has the same weight, has the same importance. The other aspect of ESP is that uh, um, ESP uh, embraces a variety of design flows, uh, specification uh, languages uh, for hardware, as well as uh, uh, computer-aided design tools. So it does not di dictate one particular language on one particular tool. We try as much as possible to be very flexible. Um, as we are flexible in the architecture, trying to integrate uh, uh, different components, we are trying to be also flexible in the methodology. And so this brings me to the two uh, most important words, really, <laughs> that uh, combine, give you the concept of platform. Architecture, for us, a platform is the combination of an architecture, computer architecture, and a computer-aided design methodology. In particular, uh, the architecture, as you'll see in ESP, uh, is a scalable architecture. And the methodology is a flexible methodology. Why uh, we stress a lot the concept of platform? Because we think the architecture is important because it enables design reuse when it automates the integration of many components that are independently developed. And SOC methodology is important because it enables the design collaboration when it allows designer to choose the appropriate specification languages and level of abstraction to design new IP blocks. So an effective combination of architecture and methodology provides, in our opinion, an agile flow that can enhance the potential of open source hardware. So let me, at a very high level, give an introduction of the architecture methodology really in one minute, and then uh, uh, I let uh, Paolo uh, take over and go in much more detail. So the ESP architecture is a tile-based architecture. In this picture, you see a very simple example that fits into a slide uh, of a, a nine-tile matrix, a three by three. But uh, um, we, as you will see later uh, in the tutorial, uh, we can the number, and the mix, and the shape of the matrix can change. Uh, tiles uh, um, are um, come in different uh, flavors, uh, but as you will see, the most uh, uh, there are some classes of tiles which are particularly important. We have processor tiles, we have accelerator tiles, we have memory tiles, and then we have a certain type of memory called shell, uh, local memory tiles and auxiliary tiles. All the tiles are integrated with socket, which is a very important concept that uh, plays multiple roles. It interface the tiles with the interconnect, which is typically a scalable network on chip. It also, the socket, uh, provides uh, uh, for each uh, tile, for the content of each tile, access to uh, a variety of distributed platform services. We have platform services uh, that uh, simplify for an accelerator, for example, direct memory access platform services that provide different level of configurable coherency, even reconfigurable coherency. We have support for internal requests. So the idea of platform services is really something that comes with the architecture and allows the developer of, for instance, the accelerator, one particular accelerator, to rely on the existence of this service and not having to reinvent the wheel every time a new accelerator is developed or every time a new SOC is uh, realized combining 
components like accelerator the processor. So these are, we have the, should I add the animation here, the processor tile, the accelerator tile, the memory tile, and the auxiliary tile. Um, we will go in more detail into the main characteristic of each tile soon. Comparing to the architecture, we have the methodology, as we said. So here, uh, this highlights one particular aspect of the methodology, which is uh, how um, you um, have the opportunity with ESP to develop components for the ESP library, the hardware library and the software library, using a variety of design flows. So we have one methodology, which has certain concepts uh, carefully uh, developed over the years in uh, com in, in tight relationship with the architecture, but within this methodology, we support a variety of design flows. For example, let's focus on the design of accelerators. It's possible to design accelerator uh, at the register transfer level using Ver Verilog, DHDL, System Verilog, or Chisel, and traditional logic synthesis. But it's also possible to design accelerator at a higher level of abstraction, which we often promote uh, and advocate. So using C, C++, or System C, and there are a variety of commercial high-level synthesis tools, as indicated in this slide, that you can use with ESP to design an accelerator for this. Uh, and then we have started developing uh, design flows for particular domains. So in particular, here we highlight uh, a design flow that we develop in collaboration uh, um, with another open source project. Uh, we leverage the HLS for ML project, which we contribute, but it's a separate project for ESP. And uh, this is a project that provides uh, um, tool, a set of tools that take a specification of neural networks given in common uh, frameworks like Kera TensorFlow or PyTorch and uh, um, returns uh, um, a specification of an accelerator for this neural network, which is synthesizable with a high level synthesis. So then this can be combined with ESP because from this accelerator then can be taken and uh, uh, integrated with the rest of uh, a system on chip using the concept of sockets and the architecture that I illustrated before. So the, independently from which tool you use, which design flows you use, uh, you can enrich uh, the library of uh, hardware IP blocks, as well as the uh, library of software components that help in the integration of uh, these IP blocks. You can use uh, also in this library, you can also find third-party accelerator or third-party processor cores. And all these components, independently from the language or the tool that has been used to develop each of them, can then be integrated into an instance of a system on chip. And ESP, as you will see, uh, offers a graphical user interface and a set of tools behind that that uh, simplify uh, a lot the integration of these heterogeneous components, as well as a push button, essentially, flow for rapid prototyping of the system on chip on FPGA. So uh, this is uh, uh, an example of um, what, how you can use the ESP uh, um, graphical user interface, once you have uh, in the library, uh, the components uh, that uh, you need in order to um, develop one particular instance of an SOC. And in this particular case, as you can see, there is it's just an example. Uh, is a, a, the SOC turns out to be based on architecture with uh, six tiles on a matrix three by two. And uh, you can choose uh, various things. You can choose uh, which processor to have in the processor type which particular implementation out of many different ones you want to have one for one accelerator into an accelerator tiles, uh, which particular configuration for the cache, and so forth and so on. There is a lot of uh, opportunity for configurations, uh, uh, configure, for configuring the memory hierarchy, configuring the network on chip, add monitors to uh, uh, observe the behavior of the system once it runs, and, uh, real workload application on top of Linux on the FPGA, and therefore go back and maybe uh, refine certain aspect of the system, an implementation of an accelerator, um, a particular uh, configuration of the cache uh, hierarchy. And also, as I said, there are certain opportunity for uh, a dynamic reconfiguration for some of the services. So I hope that this is uh, sufficient as a high level introduction. Now I stop uh, the share and I let Paolo uh, continue and give you um, a little bit more detailed view of some of the key concepts of ESP. Paolo? Okay, thank you, Luca. So, 
Moving into um, a little more details uh, about the architecture, um, I want to start from uh, the most important component uh, in, the, in the architecture, which is the accelerator tile. Um, ESP gives like similar way to both processor cores and accelerators in the architecture. Um, and you know this regularity of, of the architecture helps particularly when you go down to the physical uh, design implementation, but it also helps from a logical perspective um, when it's time uh, to uh, offload tasks to one uh, uh, processing element versus another one. And so the accelerator tile is really what distinguishes uh, um, ESP, I think. And it's where all of the flows that Luca just showed will actually converge. So in this tile, you find uh, proxy components, as I call them, which are basically um, um, little elements that make sure that the accelerator sees the entire system as if it were local and same goes for the processor. So what I mean here is that they act as the component that typically in a system which is based on a, on a bus, for example, um, will be connected directly to that bus and be closely available to the component, right? So we have some uh, uh, components like the private cache, which is optional in the TLB that handle um, coherency and the virtual memory for the accelerator. There's a DMA controller that allows the accelerator to access, access transparently uh, main memory or depending on the degree of coherency that you select the runtime, the cache hierarchy. Um, there is a user configurable set of registers that are used to configure the accelerator. And uh, in the hands-on tutorial, we'll see how to create the uh, custom registers that add to this uh, register file. And then there is a proxy that allows the accelerator to deliver interrupts to the interrupt controller of the system and then from there to the CPUs. So all of these components allow the designer of the accelerator to just think about the algorithm that they're implementing and accelerating and forget completely about the system memory map, um, if you have or not coherency or where the memory tile is, which kind of processor you're using. All of that is kind of hidden from the designer and there are all these layers of translation between the accelerator and the network and chip interconnect that allow you just to think and focus on your IP. Now, some other services that are not in the picture, uh, but are very interesting are, for example, dynamic voltage frequency scaling. Um, we have the ability of prototyping it on FPGA by actually scaling the frequency. And of course, the controller assumes that you um, can have integrated voltage regulators either on package or even on chip to be able to um, control um, the voltage and frequency of your tile um, at the granularity, as I said, of a single tile or of cluster of tiles. Now, in addition to this, since when you're designing accelerators, you also you particularly care about the parallelism of the data path, uh, we also have a tool to uh, create automatically the uh, memory subsystem for the accelerator. And the reason is when you design your highly parallel data path, particularly if you use high-level synthesis and you decide to unroll loops and so to kind of automatically generate copies of the same logic to make sure you can process in parallel multiple elements of a vector or a matrix or, or, or anything like that, you also need to be able to feed this data path, right? So that your uh, pipeline, your throughput is preserved. Now, the way you wanna do it, if you wanna be able to do some nice design space exploration is to generate as many memory uh, subsystems as your configurations, as your microarchitectures for your accelerators, so that you always, you always hit the, op the optimal point for your memory subsystem with respect to the data path. And so I will briefly show you um, later the file that configures this memory generator. Um, but the point here is really, we wanna make sure that this step is automated as much as possible so that again, you can only think, uh, you can think just about your algorithm. Now, this style is used for any of the flows that in ESP um, uh, you can uh, select to create a new IP, a new accelerator. However, we are aware that with open source hardware, there is a lot of third party IPs and accelerators out there that you may want to use. So in this case, we created a third party accelerator tile in which most of these services degenerate into standard bus adapters so that, um, your accelerator, which most likely already has some engine to do DMA or some register file based on uh, your a particular application that contains already um, the registers that hold the configuration that will be set by software, right? And so most of these services 
do not appear in this style and they are replaced by bus standards. Right now we have AXI, AXI Lite, HP and APB, which are uh, widely uh, adopted. And through these adapters, your accelerator can still send messages over the NOC, both coherent and non-coherent DMA planes, um, and it can be configured from software. Now, most importantly here, you are able to use your unmodified third-party software, which is very important. You don't want to rewrite your software just because you've integrated the accelerator into an SOC platform like ESP. So you can design your accelerator on a, for example, a ThinQ, <laughs> just to uh, name one, and then take your accelerator and integrate it into the full system without modifying your software, as long as this compiles, of course, for, uh, for one of the supported processor cores. Now, the processor tile, follows a similar concept, um, except that here we have a few more ISA and processor specific components uh, because that's the nature of the processor itself. So we have the same um, uh, level two private cache that kind of translates uh, the uh, level one cache protocol into the uh, network and chip based uh, directory based protocol of ESP. And then we've got again, uh, the bus adapters to access memory, to access cache hierarchy, uh, to access uh, memory map registers and IO. And then on top of that, um, we have added some processor specific components for particularly uh, timer and intra protocols. So right now we're supporting three types of cores, uh, RISC-5 Ariane 64-bit, RISC-5 IBEX microcontroller, and Spark Leon 3. So each of these core has different protocols for interrupt uh, delivery. For example, Leon 3 has a dedicated line between the processor and the interrupt controller for both interrupt request and acknowledge. Um, RISC-5 uses the platform level interrupt controller and that acts a bit differently. There's a direct line for the request, but the acknowledge is sent through uh, memory map registers. So this little proxy component that delivers the interrupt level request and acknowledge is able to send messages on the network and chip, but then it customizes the uh, information that delivers to the interrupt controller on one end and to the processor tile on the other end such that it works with the specific processor. And this is the only part of the processor tile that is not um, autom automated uh, for the integration because it obviously requires you to know that particular uh, protocol. Now, one important thing is that um, when you integrate the processor through the uh, ESP processor tile, you can boot unmodified Linux. There's no ESP specific patch in Linux. Um, except for a few uh, device drivers because we're using a, a particular ethernet module from uh, um, an open source library. But there's no patch to the Linux core itself. Um, and then finally, the memory tile um, is again, based on the same concept of having proxies and sockets for the components. But in this case, it's not meant for people to integrate components. Instead, it implements most of the services to access data. So in the memory tile, you will find a partition of the last of a cache with its, uh, with its directory, uh, a DDR controller adapter, if um, you have it available for your target technology. And so of course for FPGAs, we have it. And we also have an optional FPGA link uh, that would allow you to use an FPGA as a proxy to access DDR in case you want to target, for example, a NASIC technology for which you do not have access to a DDR controller. Here is also where um, the runtime configuration of um, coherency for accelerator happens. And uh, Charles Slater will, um, will explain uh, a lot more about this. But basically, we allow the runtime to redirect the messages that come from the accelerators, uh, either to the last level cache or to the uh, memory controller in order to have different uh, levels of hardware supported coherency, depending on the particular accelerator and, and depending on your uh, data size especially. Now, a variation of the memory tile is the scratch pad memory tile or a shared local memory tile. We call this shared local memory as opposed to private local memory, which is the name we uh, refer to, um, we use to refer to the accelerator scratch pad with the one that is integrated in the accelerator. Because in this case, this scratch pad is actually software managed, memory mapped and shared across all accelerators and all CPUs that can use the DMA planes to access um, directly uh, the on-chip memory here. Uh, there's, again, the same set of proxy and adapters here that basically allow you to interact with the bus uh, on which the scratch pad leaves. And the size is configurable from the GUI. Finally, um, if you want to easily program a new accelerator that um, 
that you create with one of the ESP flows, you would use the application that the flow generates for you. And this application is a skeleton, really. You need, uh, you will see later in the hands-on what you need to change, but basically it relies on a very simple API, uh, low-level API that for you does three main things. One, it allocates memory in such a way that it is efficient to access from the accelerator and the processor at the same time. Secondly, it creates uh, threads to invoke, to invoke all the accelerators that your application needs in parallel. And in a simple configuration struct, you can um, insert the dependencies between the accelerators so that these, these threads will wait on each other depending on the uh, particular needs of the application. And finally, of course, you can free the memory that you've allocated. This API lies on top of a little ESP library to invoke the accelerators, and then on top of uh, uh, the ESP accelerator device drivers. There is a core component for this device driver, which is common and provides you all of the um, features to configure the socket. And then on the side, there are small application specific device drivers that are fully generated together with the accelerator skeleton when you choose one of the uh, flows to design new accelerators. And this will just um, connect on top of the core module of ESP to invoke the accelerator. All right, so from here, I stop sharing and Joseph, if you want to take the screen, uh, we're gonna show a little demo and a, a little case study about performance uh, of cache coherency reconfiguration. All right, thank you, Paolo. Um, so one of the aspects that we've used ESP to research um, most about heterogeneous SOCs is cache coherence for accelerators. So I'm gonna show how ESP makes it easy to study performance of hardware accelerators. And I'll be focusing on cache coherence, but these general principles can apply to other research ideas as well. So first I'll give a little background on coherence for accelerators and the ESP cache hierarchy and talk a bit about the ESP performance monitoring system. And then I'll show two demos that make use of it in different ways. So an important question about the integration of hardware accelerators is how should they interact with the memory hierarchy? And throughout the literature, we've identified four main cache coherence modes for accelerators. The first of these is a fully coherent accelerator in which the accelerator owns its own private cache to which it sends memory requests. So the accelerator in this case participates in the system's coherence protocol, just like CPUs would. Accelerators can also operate fully coherently without a private cache, a mode that's also referred to as coherent DMA. In this case, the accelerators generally have no notion of coherence, so a bridge is required to convert the accelerator's request to the coherent system interconnect. In this case, the cache hierarchy maintains full coherence, so the last level cache needs to recall or invalidate any accelerator data that might be in the private caches. In a non-coherent DMA mode, memory, memory requests bypass the cache hierarchy entirely. So this means that software needs to enforce coherence. In ESP, we allocate accelerated data in a cacheable region. So this means that at runtime, we have to flush the entire cache hierarchy for this particular coherence mode. Finally, in the middle of this spectrum is the LLC coherent DMA mode. This mode also generally requires a bridge from the accelerator to the coherent interconnect. But in this case, the accelerator is kept coherent with the LLC and not with the private caches. Again, you will need some sort of software enforced coherence um, to maintain coherence with the private caches. And since ESP keeps this, the accelerator data in a cacheable region, the private caches need to be flushed at runtime. So our ESP coherence protocol is built on a modification of a, direct, a standard directory-based messy protocol. We designed the protocol to support multi-core execution capable of booting Linux SMP over a network on chip and also support all four main coherence modes for accelerators. 
As Paolo mentioned, the memory tile hosts the last level cache and the directory information. Our LLC is right back and can recall data from the private L2 caches as needed. And the most distinguishing feature of our last level cache is the ability to handle DMA requests. The ESP L2 cache can be instantiated in both the processor and accelerator tiles. It handles all of our atomic operations and interfaces with the L1 that comes with our supported CPUs. At SOC design time, the cache sizes can be configured and we also have two different implementations of the caches to select from. The system Verilog version is more optimized, but the system C plus high level synthesis version is a more friendly starting point for those wanting to perform some experiments or maybe conduct their own research on cache coherence. And one exciting note is that thanks to the work of our friends at UIUC, we'll soon have a cache hierarchy with support for Spandex, their flexible heterogeneous coherence interface. And as Paolo alluded to earlier, we also support runtime selection for accelerator coherence from all four of the models that I, that I discussed. Um, the accelerator tile contains a configuration register for the coherence mode, which can be set like any other parameter of the accelerator. The private cache is optional in the accelerator tile, but it enables the fully coherent mode. In this case, the cache sends out the memory requests through the coherence knock planes. The other three coherence modes are always enabled. Because the ESP LLC can handle DMA requests, we don't require any bridge in the accelerator tile to the system interconnect. The requests are sent on the DMA knock planes and are routed appropriately when they're received in the memory tile. In ESP, we also have a hardware performance monitoring system in which you can observe metrics like memory accesses uh, and bandwidth, the cache hit or miss rate, congestion on the network on chip, and accelerator execution time. Uh, we also have two options for, for reading this data. The first option is using registers that are dispersed throughout the tiles of the SOC. The registers are memory mapped so they can be read by software running on ESP. This is particularly useful if you want to design an application that makes decisions based on the performance data. In this case, when the monitor data is read, it's the data is sent over the network on chip to the CPU. So this of course can slightly impact your performance measurements like the knock congestion. Uh, this option is always enabled by default. The other option is to have the data sent directly over an ethernet connection to a graphical application running on a host machine. The data can be viewed live through the GUI and then detailed results are reported at the end of execution. This feature is optional, but can be enabled uh, at design time to the ESP GUI. So the first demo that we've prepared um, is on runtime selection of coherence for an FFT accelerator. It's a simple SOC configured with one FFT accelerator with a 32 kilobyte private cache, one CPU, and one memory tile with a 256 kilobyte last level cache. The software application that we've written invokes the FFT accelerator once for each coherence mode. The application is also modified very little from the template generated by ESP. The data set size is configurable from the command line by specifying a number of FFT batches to perform. And the performance data is automatically collected by the ESP API using the first option for performance monitoring uh, using the memory map counters in each tile. So I'm going to switch over to a terminal and I'll first highlight a bit of the code that, that enables this experiment. First, we'll look at a file that specifies the configuration of the FFT accelerator. Joseph, You'll see a number of- a little bit? I zoom think. in. Yeah, a little bit. I think on small screens, this might be too small. Thank you. How's that? A little more? Yeah, even a bit more if you can. 
So this file contains a number of de defines and also most notably the configuration for our FFT accelerator. We can see a few parameters that are particular to the FFT accelerator among other parameters such as the coherence that can be selected at runtime. The ESP API takes care of configuring the accelerator. So all the user needs to do is specify the correct parameters and then use the appropriate ESP API function calls. I'll, then sh I'll now show our software application, which will look very similar to the, the skeleton generated by ESP. We first read in uh, a number of batches from the command line and then configure a few options based on the selection. Then we'll allocate a buffer for the accelerator to use using the ESP alloc API call. And we, we pass this uh, buffer to the API through the configuration data structure that I've shown before. Then we loop over each coherence mode. And for each mode, we initialize a buffer, the buffer for the accelerator to use, and also prepare the golden output to validate the accelerator outputs. We configure the ESP uh, coherence mode for this invocation, and then call ESP run to invoke the accelerator with our specified configuration. Once this returns, the accelerator has finished executing and we can validate the output. And then we can collect statistics passed back to us through this configuration parameter from the ESP API. In this, in this case, we're collecting um, the execution time, the number of memory accesses, and some statistics about the accelerator execution cycles and hardware. Once, once we're done with all coherence modes, we can free, clean up the buffer allocated with ESP free and then we will print the performance statistics that are collected. So on the right side, I have open a Minicom session, which is connected to an FPGA running ESP that has already booted Linux. I'm now gonna run the application that I showed uh, with a few different input sizes. So with just one batch, the workload is, is quite small. You can see that the latter three coherence modes have nearly zero uh, memory accesses. This is because the data is already warmed up by the CPU. So it, it, and since this data set is small, it fits comfortably in the caches. So we don't need any off chip um, memory accesses. The non-coherent DMA mode, on the other hand, has quite a number and also an increased execution time because of the flush that's required before execution of the accelerator. If we increase the number of batches slightly, we can see the, the trends mostly hold, except now the fully coherent accelerator performance degrades relatively to the rest because now with, th with this number of batches, the data set no longer will fit in the private cache of the accelerator. Increasing the workload size some more to a size that no longer fits in our last level cache, this will take a little bit longer. We can see now the memory accesses for all modes jump significantly because the workloads no longer fit in the, in, in the caches. The execution time of the fully coherent is now significantly the worst and the non-coherent DMA mode is catching up to the middle two. Finally, we'll increase the size to a much bigger one, which will again take a little bit longer. So now we can actually see that the three modes that use some form of coherence have worse memory accesses than the non-coherent DMA mode. The, since the workload sizes have gotten quite large, um, the caches now endure thrashing. So you actually have more memory accesses than accessing um, the DRAM directly with the non-coherent DMA mode. 
We can also see that the three DMA modes all have a pretty similar run um, execution time. So now that the workload is pretty large, the cost of the flush is, is quite insignificant in comparison to the execution time of the accelerator. So this slide summarizes the results for the experiment that I just showed. Um, each, each workload size is normalized um, to the non-coherent DMA mode, and we're reporting both the execution time and memory accesses. Um, these sizes, the categorizations, refer to um, in comparison to our particular cache sizes. Um, and since accelerators tend to have different types of access patterns, um, I want to stress that these results um, might look completely different for a different accelerator. Um, but the key takeaway here is that no coherence mode performs the best in all situations, even though we're always using the same accelerator. So this leads us um, into the next demo, which is on an adaptive algorithm for coherence selection at runtime. Um, we designed an introspective algorithm that makes a decision at each accelerator invocation based on static and dynamic system parameters. The experiments use 12 configurable traffic generator accelerators. And this demo also shows the other use case of the ESP performance monitors with the external GUI. And for this demo, we have a short video that's been pre-recorded. Now let's dive into the FPGA demo. First, we are loading a bitstream of our SOC on a Vertex 7 FPGA. This script first deploys the bitstream on FPGA and then loads Linux SMP and starts the boot, which we will follow in this other window through Minicom. In the meantime, we're going to launch on a host machine a monitor GUI, which collects live statistics from our system on chip on FPGA through an Ethernet link. Here we're just showing some of the data graphically, but the monitor data coming out of the SOC is really useful to perform architectural exploration directly on FPGA. Uh, by taking a look at the monitor GUI, while the multi-core boot completes on FPGA, we see that on the top left, there's the SOC under test, which counts two memory controllers, two CPUs, and 12 accelerators. These are distinct synthetic accelerators with a wide range of communication properties. At the bottom right, we have a graphical view of the NOC traffic, uh, but only for the two bidirectional DMA planes. The router-to-router -router links will be colored to indicate, indicate the amount of traffic. Once logged into Linux, we launch a synthetic application and then launch the data collection in the monitor GUI. If you look at the terminal on the left, you'll see the LLC argument, which means that in this case, all accelerators are running in last level cache coherent mode. The second argument, non, means that we are letting Linux choose freely where to allocate memory. The application currently running is composed of nine phases, where the first phases have at most one active accelerator at each time, whereas the last phases have up to 12 active, active accelerators. Phases also differ in the size of the workloads. As the execution proceeds, you can observe the knock traffic in the GUI. And then once the execution will end, we will take a look at the final statistics of NOC traffic. By looking at average and max, we can see that more traffic went to the memory controller at the top left and that many NOC links have not been used at all. 
Now we will re-execute the application by enabling our adaptive algorithm. Uh, notice the auto argument in the terminal. And with the second auto argument, we are also enabling some policies for better distributing the memory allocations across the two memory controllers. These policies do not affect performance significantly in this case, but we will see clearly a much better distribution of the traffic. As a first result in the terminal, we can see that um, the per phase execution time is decreasing. Uh, and we can also notice how many more NOC channels are used and that the traffic is spread out more evenly across the SOC. We can now look at the average and maximum NOC traffic and we see how it's really spread evenly across the SOC. Here are the results after running the application with two other baselines, all accelerators non-coherent and all accelerators fully coherent. Our adaptive algorithm, represented by the first bar, reduces both execution time and off-chip accesses. To conclude, this experiment was able to successfully exploit the cache coherence reconfiguration capabilities of our architecture, and all of this is transparent from the point of view of the programmer. Thank you very much for your attention. So that, that concludes uh, my two demos, and I hope that um, sort of demonstrates the power and ease of ESP to perform some interesting experiments with accelerators on FPGA. And with that, I'll pass the ball to Paolo, um, who will go through the uh, System C accelerator design flow. Okay. There we go. So this is um, the first uh, accelerator design flow um, that we um, that we created within ESP, and. Um, and, and so it makes sense to start with this. Um, it is a very simple test case example. And now that you have seen what can be done from an architectural viewpoint, um, so that you can kind of focus on the steps uh, required to generate and then customize a new IP that you may want to integrate in your um, ESP instance and to then start to some uh, interesting uh, architectural research with it. So the the flow really, uh, and this is common to all of the HLS flow, relies on the model of the accelerator that uh, looks pretty much like the one you see here. Uh, we have basically four main phases, the configuration phase, which is when your device driver, your processor through software configures the accelerator and the registers. And then there are three concurrent phases, load, compute, and store that uh, run in parallel and basically make sure that you get the data from the memory hierarchy, run your customized uh, um, algorithm or, 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 or function, and then store the results back. And here, the private local memory, which we generate as part of the uh, generation of the skeleton of the accelerator, is what allows you to pipeline these three phases so that when you are operating on a large data set that cannot be completely stored on chip, you hide as much as possible the latency of load and store uh, through computation. So you can think of this as a real pipeline, right? When you uh, fill in the pipe, load the, the first segment of your data, start computing, in the meantime, you load the next part. And same goes for store. Um, the generation of this uh, skeleton is interactive. And so there's this little script, which I'm going to show you in a second, that asks you very uh, simple questions about your accelerator to generate a customized version of this skeleton. And then once you have it, the flow is completely automated to integrate it into the system, uh, generate the RTL, generate the proxies and the sockets, and then generate the full system instance. So if you have it open, um, this is when you probably want to have this page handy. Um, here, where you have all of the details step uh, to create this accelerator. I'll go through these steps, uh, of course, on the screen, but it could help if you have the page open as well. Um, with the Docker, if you manage to start it, please remember to source uh, the environment script. 
um, that just uh, exports some default variables that are necessary to run the scripts and the compile software and compile the accelerator, the accelerator for execution. And it should be located in the folder that you see when you just open up the shell of your Docker. All right, so let me start. Let's move this on the side, okay. So the first thing that you want to do is enter your uh, ESP root folder. And then you want to run the actgen script, which creates the uh, accelerator skeleton. So it's gonna be in tools, actgen, and then there's gonna be a bash script to run. So the first thing it asks is for the name of your accelerator. So we're going to do a very simple element-wise subtraction here. Um, we're gonna leave Stratos as default, so S. And then the ESP path, if you run the script from the ESP root, it's gonna pick the right folder. And here we have to select a unique ID. Uh, it's gonna be three hex digits, um, 061, for example. Um, and here is where the customization of your accelerator really starts. So you're free to give these registers uh, the name you want. I'm just going to use some relevant name, of course, but for example, we wanna do some element wise uh, subtraction. So we need the length of our vector. Um, and I'm gonna call this sub length. And then the script will ask you for a default value. This is the value that is going to be used when generating the uh, skeleton for your test applications and the test bench. So for example, let's say that by default, uh, we have eight elements. Um, but of course we may wanna operate on much larger vectors. So I don't know, 1024 or something like that. Now, second register name. Uh, I'm gonna use a register called batch. Um, which basically I'm going to use to tell my accelerator that I want to process more than one vector uh, within a single invocation. Um, the default value, let's say two, so two vectors um, in a single invocation by default, and maybe, I don't know, 400 or so, which is, I think, the value we set in the uh, example is the maximum value. The maximum value is important because the script will compute um, the necessary size for your local memory depending on some parameters. And, uh, and so it is important that you think through what's the maximum value uh, that you may want to assign your register to. Now, when you're done, you just leave the name empty and the script will continue to the next question. So here it asks the, um, the data token size. And this is just the default one. Of course, you may have uh, examples in which you transfer times uh, floating point numbers and then you know 16 uh, bit integers and so on. But it's asking for the main data token, the one that will be used to create the default DMA transactions. So in this case, let's say that we are operating on vectors of uh, shorts, so integer 16. So we'll choose 16 as the data bit width for default. Now here's the interesting part. We need to tell our script how to compute the minimum size of, um, of data, the minimum data set on which the accelerator can compute. So let's assume that this accelerator uh, at the minimum can operate on a full vector, which can be of, on, of size from one to 1024, as we said above. And so the input size of our single computation loop will be defined exactly by the value of this register. So we can use, we can create any expression that uses the uh, registers here. So let's say sub length. So the script will compute that the data input size max is 1024 because we said that the maximum value for sub length is 1024. Now, th since this is an element wise operation, the output is also going to be of the same size and it's going to compute the output size as well. Now the chunking factor as um, a fancy name that we use here just to tell the script that we may or may not want the private local memory to be able to hold the entire data set. So let's say that you want to save storage, you don't have a lot of area, and um, and then you want to split your computation, you would select a chunking factor, for example, of two, then your memory will only be able to hold half of your vector when you select the largest size, and then the computation will be split into two DMA transactions. Now to keep it simple for now, we'll leave it one, and then you see that the script will compute the private local memory size as 1024 elements of 16-bit word, both for the input and the output. Remember load, compute, and store, and the private local memory sits in between as buffers to allow the pipeline innovate. So you have both an input and an output memory. 
Now here is the batching factor, which is how many of these data tokens do you want to compute in a single invocation? This can be a constant, but in this case, we've created a register precisely for this reason. And so sub batch is going to be our batching factor. Now the script detects that in this particular case, input and output size are the same. So it asks if you want also to store data back to the memory hierarchy in place. Now let's say yes, in this case, we'd like to save some uh, memory footprint. And so with this, we've generated the skeleton of the accelerator. So please, if you have questions, just type them in the, in the chat and uh, some of, uh, of my friends can, can just vocalize the question. And, uh, and so we can stop and answer the questions before I go ahead. Now, having, having done this, what you will see if you move to the accelerator folder and then Stratus HLS folder, you will see that there is a new sub Stratus subfolder, which has been created for you. Here you have both the hardware skeleton and the software skeleton. So let's start from the hardware. There's an HLS folder, which includes the scripts for uh, higher level synthesis, in this case with Stratus, because we selected Stratus. There's a memory list file, and this is the list of memory elements that we need in our, uh, to generate our uh, private local memory. So you'll see that we have, for example, two versions, DMA32 and DMA64, because depending on the processor core that you select, uh, the size, the bit width of the architecture will be either 32-bit or 64. So you have memories for both options. And then since we said that we want to hold the entire data set, you'll have a 1024 times 16 memory. And now consider this. If you have a 32-bit DMA port, but you are transferring 16-bit elements, you want to be able to write two elements at a time. So there is information about the parallel accesses that you want to be able to do in your memory listed here. And in this example, what we need, and this is again is generated, you can change this based on your uh, particular implementation of the accelerator. But by default, at least we need to write two elements at a time. As we read from the DMA port, 32 bits, we write two elements in this, in this memory block. And then the data path, by default, if we don't want to do any uh, loop and rolling or things like that, we'll just read one element at a time and operate on that. All right. So. Let me do one thing that you don't need to do. Um, this is just to speed up um, HLS with Stratus. Uh, basically, I have created an HLS uh, working folder. And this is clean, a clean folder. But you see there's this cache lib pre-generated. Uh, because the first time you run high level synthesis, if you're familiar with those kind of tools, uh, the tool will be going through logic synthesis to generate a lot of uh, resources. And that can take a lot of time. So in the interest of time, I pre-generated this cache list. All right. So what we're going to do now is customize our accelerator. So we move to the hardware source folder. And we open the sub.cpp file. Now we locate the compute kernel here. And in particular, you see, for example, this code has been generated based on your um, parameter selection. You see that the uh, registers sub batch and sub length have been created. And in the configuration phase, what we do is we wait for the software to say that the configuration is valid. And then we just read into a temporary variable the content of the configuration registers. Now, what you see under this compute uh, comment here is really what you want to customize. In this super simple example, uh, will just change the identity function into a very simple uh, element-wise subtraction. Now, anything that the I-level synthesis tool can digest is legal here, of course. And this is where the designer should focus. Like you want to implement your data path here and you want to use all sorts of I-level synthesis techniques uh, that you can in order to make it more efficient and uh, more performant. So let's just do this. So we have customized our accelerator. We're doing this element-wise subtraction. Now, in order for this to work, of course, we also need to change our test bench so that it will expect that result. So we move to the hardware TB folder and open the system.cpp file. Now, here we have to locate the input and golden output creation. Uh, you will notice that there's a few if-def based on the DMA size. 
And there are functions like Roundup here that are used just to make sure that the DMA transactions are aligned to the size of your DMA channel. That simplifies a lot um, the uh, interconnect, particularly when you want to enable LLC coherent DMA. All right, so what we need to do here, the input can be this default input here, or you can change it with a randomized input. But what we need to change really is the golden output, which is not going to be the identity function anymore, but it's going to be the same element-wise subtraction that we have implemented in our accelerator. All right, so everything else, including the model of the DMA, the model of the configuration registers, the model of the interrupt is being generated for you. So changing the input generation here and golden output generation here is really all you need to do to create a simple accelerator. And then of course, in the accelerator uh, code, you need to implement your computation function. Now, once you have this, we can move to a uh, SOC design folder. Like for example, uh, um, you enter the SOCs and like for example, the VCU 118 folder, you make sure if you have exported your um, environment, you should have uh, system C exported. In my case, I also have other tools. Uh, and what we want to do is try to make sub stratus execution target. So this target is simply- uh, Paolo, I, I think yes. this one uh, only you can do. I don't think they can do this one in the Docker. But yeah. Right, right. This requires yeah. the, that's true. This yeah, requires yeah. the Stratos HLS headers. Um, yeah, this is one of those steps. Mm -hmm. So what this does is executing the uh, behavioral model in system C. Now, since we're using the Stratos HLS flow, it also uh, includes some uh, CAD specific header files. And so if you don't have a Stratus uh, uh, installed in your machine, you won't be able to run this. But basically this is the fastest way to check that your code is correct. And you see that the validation is passed because the golden output is the same as the uh, output generated by the accelerator. Now from here, you can also run, and this again requires the license, uh, Stratus HLS. Now the first step, let me stop here the screen, runs the memory generator. It picks that memlist file that I've shown you before and generates the uh, Verilog for the memory subsystem for you. And again, this allows for multiple ports based on the number of banks that are uh, instantiated. You see that here we're using the block runs because we're targeting a, a Xilinx FPGA. Uh, for different technologies, you would have to provide um, the script with uh, the location of the um, basic blocks, so the SRAM generated memories, for example, uh, the SRAM generator uh, memories, for example. And then the script will just adapt to those memories and try to minimize the, uh, the resource utilization or area, uh, but still while implementing the requested number of ports and uh, um, with words and bits that you selected. Now, the next step is running HLS and you see it's running here. While this runs, um, uh, let me move back for a second to the accelerator folder. And instead of going into the hardware folder, we enter the software folder this time. Let's start from the bare metal and let's open the sub.c file. There's a function called init buff and it really looks exactly the same as the test bench, but in this case it's a C code that will execute on the processor core. And in this case in bare metal without booting Linux. So we change the same thing we want to make sure that our golden output is what the accelerator is generating, right? And so we basically fix the validation portion of the, of, the, uh, of the software. And then we do the same for the Linux application, sub.c, init buffer, golden output, and that's it. Now, everything else looks very similar to what Joseph showed you before. Um, there's a function that initializes some parameters. In particular, it computes the input sizes and the output sizes based on uh, the information that you gave in the script before. Uh, you see that uh, we assign uh, the buffer allocated with VSP alloc to our configuration. Of course, we create some memory for uh, the golden output, initialize the buffer, which is the function we just edited, uh, print some information about the configuration, and these are uh, the user-defined parameters, so you can check uh, which particular application-specific 
configuration you're using. And then it runs the accelerator by calling the ESP run. Validates, freeze, and returns. And prints either pass or fail. OK. Now you see that HLS is completed. And if you want to be able to do the steps that Davide will show later, you see that a few um, RTL files have been copied to the ESP technology uh, library. So you should just do the following, uh, which is listed in the web page. You see there's an ESP tech vertical ultra scale plus in this case, because we've chosen the VCU 118 um, FPGA slash accelerator. And you see that there's a substratus uh, folder with the two DMA32 and DMA64 HLS configurations. So if you just create these two and touch the XML file uh, inside this specific uh, uh, folder um, path, which is listed on the web page again, then the ESP GUI will be able to see the accelerator and you'll be able to kind of select it. Of course, Inside here, we have the RTL. If you cannot run Stratus, you won't uh, see the RTL. And you will not be able to run logic synthesis and simulations. But still, if you generate the folders, the GUI will discover the accelerator. So please do this step, which I've just done here with the HLS. If you have Stratus, or um, of course, all of this is automated. Now, the next thing you want to do, again, if you have the license, is sub Stratus and then sim. Now, what this target does, and this is the end of my uh, portion of this little uh, tutorial, is running the simulation of all of the views of the accelerator within the Stratus environment. So it's going to run a system C elaborated version inside Stratus that also reads in, for example, the HLS pragmas and make sure that they are legal. It's going to run uh, the generated RTL for all the HLS configurations. So both in this case, the MA32 and the MA64. And if you created different HLS configurations, like for example, uh, to obtain different microarchitectures for your accelerator, it will also simulate all of those. And the nice uh, thing about this simulation is that it always leverages the exact same system C test bench. So you have a single test bench that simulates as a unit test all of your accelerators. Now, in most cases, when all these simulations pass, then you have uh, just a, a push button kind of flow to integrate your accelerator into the system and it's going to be working by construction because the test bench is emulating the system around the accelerator all right so with this let me stop my sharing and davide if you want to continue yes one sec yeah, Paolo, there's a couple of questions uh, they just asked in the more comments if you want to reply in the chat. While I start. Okay, I, I re thank you. I'll reply in the chat then. Okay, so you can see my screen. Let's see where we are with respect to the list of steps. Uh, what Paolo was saying about generating some folders in XML is this step. You can just copy and paste this command. Uh, in the in the root directory of ESP. If you are in the Docker, uh, since now you, you didn't actually need it before, but now you need it, make sure to source this script. And then you can move inside the ESP folder and that's where you where you're gonna work. Uh, so this is where you can copy and paste, for example, what Paolo was showing, simply like this. And you're going to have, you're going to be, be moved inside this folder and you're going to have some accelerators. Now, I'm showing this also because I want to say here we're making you add also a different accelerator uh, on top of the one that you all created together with Paolo. This FFT is one of the accelerators already available in the ESP release, and it's also the one that Joseph used earlier for his part of the demo. Then you can just move back to the root, and we'll go from there. OK, so the point we are at is compiling the software 
With Paolo, you edited uh, some bare metal applications for testing your new accelerator, and you also edited a Linux application for testing the accelerator. So first, we're going to compile the bare metal applications for the. Let me make it a bit bigger. Okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, for the accelerator that you created, and also for FFT, and then simply by compiling Linux, the Linux image that will run on the ESP prototype on FPGA, you automatically compile the Linux test application that you edited with Paolo, as well as the device driver for your accelerator, which was automatically generated uh, by the interactive script. So I'm going to move actually here. I'm inside this SOCs folder where you already launched some commands with Paolo. Uh, in this SOCs folder, we have a bunch of different uh, directories for different FPGA targets. So depending on what FPGA you're going to work with for your prototyping, you can choose the, the proper one. If you want to have two designs for the same FPGA, all you need to do is make a copy of one of, of for example, the VCU 118 folder, you just make a copy with a different name and you can have multiple designs in, in parallel. That's how we do that part. Uh, eventually, if you're also going for an ASIC flow and for a tape out, uh, here is where you will have your folder targeting a specific uh, ASIC technology. Okay, so gonna go in. I already sourced the, the environment, and we're going to first compile the substratus Dermata lab. And then we also compile the FFT Dermata test application. As I said, this is an accelerator already available in ESP. You can see here in the accelerator status folder. And then we compile Linux. Uh, you can do J4 for, for going faster or J8. Or J uh, and as I said, while compiling Linux, we're also compiling all the Linux applications for testing the accelerators and the device drivers. Now, this Linux step for you is going to take probably a few minutes. I pre-compiled it, so that's why it, it went faster. Uh, in the meantime that it's running for you, I can show you that you can also compile the Linux application that you edited with Paolo with this specific command. So if you just want, if you are debugging, modifying the application, you just want to compile the specific application, that's the target, but it's also included in the compilation of Linux. And if you want to compile the device driver, it's, uh, this is the command. And then, of course, for FFT, you're just going to do FFT status. So, um, that's the idea. Uh, so this is for compiling the software. Still, while your Linux is running, I can show you that all the uh, software that you compile in your design folder is going in the soft build folder. For this specific target FPGA, the default processor is uh, the RIST-5 Ariane core. So everything is being compiled for Ariane. If you switch, to another processor, then you will see a new folder uh, appearing here with the software compiled for that one. Uh, when I say that there's a default configuration, uh, where are these different configurations for each FPGA? They are in SOCs, dev config. You can see a bunch of configurations. Specifically, here is the configuration for the VCU 118. And so this is the default design that if you don't modify anything, you get uh, with ESP. There's one Ariane core. There are four tiles in total. Uh, and we will see later how you can modify this default configuration through a GUI, a graphical interface. Or if you want, of course, you can just edit it in batch mode directly in this, in this uh, configuration file. Uh, so I was going to show that inside your Ariane folder, you have the compiled bare metal applications. We compiled two of them. There's both an EXE and a BIN. Uh, 
uh, we use the X for uh, the, in this case, for the RTL simulation, and then the bin is the one used for uh, FPGA. In this area, in this uh, software folder, you also see the root file system. Every time you change something, uh, either manually or through some of the steps of ESP, every time you change something in this root file system, you want to recompile Linux so that the Linux image, this linux.bin, gets updated. And this linux.bin is what we transfer on the FPGA prototype to boot Linux. So this is the end file that gets generated together with the ROM bin, which is the bootloader. Okay, so this is more or less the story for the, for the software. Uh, actually, one more thing. In, uh, again, inside your uh, soft build Ariane drivers, this is where you can find the compiled applications, uh, the compiled Linux applications. So for example, here for the substratus, we have the, both the compiled application and the compiled driver inside these folders. Okay. In the meantime, maybe the Linux compilation for you uh, has completed. Uh, if it didn't, uh, it's not a problem because I have a few things to show before you have to do the next uh, steps. I'm going to go back to the slides and, sh and show you one sec. OK. <clears throat> OK, so Paolo showed you the the flow for designing accelerators with Stratus HLS. Those accelerators designed that way can be are automatically integrated in an ESP SOC, both on the hardware side and software side. Uh, now I'm going to show you, I, I showed you how to compile the software. Now I'm going to show you uh, another flow that we have, which is for integrating third party accelerators. Uh, where here with third party, we mean when you, when you have a, or you find open, some other open source IP or you have your own accelerator already designed, not with ESP, and you want to integrate it in, in a ESP SOC. In this case, uh, the, the case study that we have is with NVDLA, which is an open source accelerator from NVIDIA. Uh, the NVIDIA Deep Learning Accelerator. It's uh, open source at this link. It's very similar to the other ESP accelerators uh, that we are going to see in this uh, tutorial. It's just much more complex, but the idea is that it's a fixed function accelerator, highly configurable with a lot of configuration registers. Um, the one, the version integrated in ESP is the NVIDIA small so that it can easily fit also in your FPGA prototypes. Um, for this third party flow, the idea is uh, the hardware gets integrated very easily. I'll show you uh, a little bit the steps. And then the idea is that you want to keep the software stack of the accelerator that you integrate as is. Um, if the accelerator doesn't have a software stack, doesn't have some device driver and application, then maybe you can use ESP to design one. But if it already has one, the idea is to keep it and compile it and use it as is, which was the case for NVIDIA Day. Uh, I'm going to already show this even before showing uh, how to use NVIDIA Day in the, in the repository. Uh, with the simple steps of the third party IP integration, we see we can create now SOCs with one, two, four, many different instances of the accelerator that we integrated. Um, also, here we can show some results of uh, ESP on FPGA at 50 megahertz, uh, integrated NVDLA, and we're running on NVDLA a bunch of different uh, neural networks, inference for a bunch of different neural networks. And the performance, if you scale from FPGA to ASIC, it's comparable to what um, the NVDLA website reports. Uh, and finally, we can also show here how easily, once you integrate it, you can build an SOC with different amounts of um, NVDLAs or, or, or amounts of the accelerator that you integrated. 
and you can see how the performance scales up more or less linearly uh, thanks to the parallelism. In the meantime, now for sure Linux must have completed the compilation. And what we're going to do next, next is I'll show you how you can compile, generate the hardware for MVDLA, compile it, and integrate it in the root file system, uh, which will go in the Linux image for the FPGA prototype. And you can do all of that with simply one command, make and name of the accelerator, name of the third party accelerator. Uh, so same folder as usual, we see 118 in this case, make MVDLA. This is generating the hardware and compiling the software. Again, for me, it's a bit faster because I compiled everything for time reasons. You, in, on your end, you will see a little bit more steps and it will take a little bit longer. Uh, this is all you need to do. And what this does is, again, in your soft, soft, software build, in the root file system, uh, now you will find an MV and VDLA folder. And this folder contains the compiled uh, runtime and runtime library of MVDLA, plus also a couple of things uh, for testing MVDLA. But there's a, a loadable for uh, running inference of a neural network. And similarly, this, was, this is on the uh, user application side and device driver. Uh, sorry, on the user application side. On the device driver side, inside sysroot opt drivers, you can see that the uh, NVDLA device driver was compiled as is and added here. And it's going to get loaded when we boot Linux on FPGA. Now, how is this third party IP integration done? Uh, first of all, we have a third party flow folder inside accelerators. At the moment, you see only one example. We have integrated uh, quite a few more accelerators with this flow. They are not public and linked here yet just because they haven't it's accelerators that we work with with some collaborators. They have not been released yet. When the accelerator gets released, we will uh, add more examples here. But the, uh, the NVDLA is already a good one to imitate if you want to integrate your own accelerator. So what you do to integrate an accelerator, um, there is a few steps. Uh, it's pretty simple overall. First of all, you design a simple wrapper for wrapping uh, the accelerator IP. The idea is this wrapper doesn't have logic. It's just about wiring uh, the third party IP to the, uh, the signal names convention of the ESP interface. So if you can see in this case, the, sorry. Okay, so this is the actual NVDLA IP. And you see there is a, CSP, this is a configuration interface, and then there is an AXI interface. NVDLA also comes with uh, an APB to CSB uh, module. So this allows to translate the configuration interface into the APB protocol, which is a standard. And then all you do is link this APB interface and the AXI interface with the top of the wrapper. And as you can see, there's no other logic in this module. Of course, at the moment, we are supporting AXI, uh, AHB, APB, the ARM standards. We plan to support more uh, different bus standards, but at the moment, this is what's supported. And of course, we always welcome contributions. So if you end up integrating your own third party IP and you uh, add support for a new bus uh, interface, we, we are happy to take the pull request. Um, and another thing that you do is, sorry, develop a simple make file. What you want to define in this make file is how you compile the software for this accelerator and how you compile or generate the hardware. 
In the case of NVDLA, the hardware is generated. There are some Perl scripts in the Verilog uh, for, for generating the actual configuration that you choose. Some accelerators don't even need to generate hardware. The RTL is fully, um, fully designed and there's no generation. So this part is a little bit custom. All you should know is that ESP is going to call your software and your hardware targets when you do, in our case, make and be NVDLA. And so this is specific to the accelerator that you are uh, developing. And then all these other files are mostly uh, lists. So uh, I'm going to show just a couple, but this list is about listing the very log files that should be included by ESP for this accelerator. Uh, or another example is the KMD. KMD stands for kernel mode driver, so device driver. And this is just listing where the compiled device driver is so that ESP can take it and add it to this uh, root file system, like I showed earlier. Um, we have a publication on, the, on this. It's all linked in this slide. So you can find more details. But more importantly, we have a tutorial on the ESP website. So you can see all the steps of the flow clearly. Now I'm going to switch back to the, to the main design folder. And we're going to go on with the next uh, steps. Of course, if you have any questions, uh, Paolo and the others are going to address them in the chat or they can tell me about them. So for the next step, uh, we're going to design some SOCs, two different SOCs with different accelerators, including the one that you designed with Paolo. Uh, and then I'm going to show you how to run full system RTL simulation, and then how to do the prototyping on FPGA. By the way, <coughs> uh, we, we showed you, Paolo showed you how to generate uh, an accelerator with Stratus. He didn't really show you yet the architecture of that accelerator, uh, but that's something that's coming up in the segment after mine. Uh, Giuseppe has a, has a nice description of the architecture of the, the ESP accelerators. OK. So, OK, so now we go into configuring the SOCs. I'm back to the guide. We're going to configure two SOCs. The first one with the Ariane core, the Ariane processor core, and the second one with the Leon 3 core. This is a 32-bit core uh, with the Spark V8 ISA. And in this case, you see how we will do a multi-core SOC with a full cache hierarchy that will be able to run a Linux multi-core. So for these steps, the command is make ESP config. I'm going back to the the terminal. So you want to be, uh, actually, you can do this from any design folder. But in this tutorial, we are working with the VC118. So from this folder, you can launch the GUI with make ESP X config. At this point, I'm going to imitate exactly what we have in the instructions. So we keep Ariane core. No cache hierarchy in this case. We only have the level one cache inside the Arian core. Then we want to do a four by three SOC. And we add multiple F50 accelerators. I'm going to place them in the same positions as in the, uh, the steps, the, the guide, but the position doesn't matter. You can place them wherever you want. So for the Stratus accelerator, you see that here there are two options. Uh, this is to show one nice thing that ESP supports. Um, and, and it's the following. Especially when you, do, um, when you design accelerators with high-level synthesis, it's very easy to get a lot of different versions of your accelerators with different optimizations and 
different trade-offs between performance, area, power consumption, right? So when you launch HLS with ESP, all of those versions will be generated. And from the GUI, you can pick the one that you want to instantiate. In this case, the difference between these two is that one is an FFT accelerator that works with 64 bits fixed point data and the other one with 32 bits fixed point. But you can also here, you basically you decide the names that you give. You can call one accelerator fast because it's the fastest, even though it's very large. One you can call the small because it's low, but, but smaller. And just to put this in context, when you, actually from the guide, When we made you generate these folders so that the GUI could see it, could see them, uh, here is where you had actually four versions of the accelerator. In this case, though, we chose the Ariane core, Ariane processor, which is 64 bits. So ESP only allows you to use uh, an accelerator with a 64 bit interface. If we switch to a 32 bit uh, processor, like this, we would we would get the other the DMA thirty two options. Okay, so back to back to the GUI. We place one CPU tile, one memory tile, two instances of the NVDLA accelerator, and then it's always necessary to have one IO tile. Whenever you're doing something that is not allowed here in this box, you get a message. In this case, the GUI knows that we need one IO tile because that's where we have the debug interface and the, in the interface of all the IO. Once you're done, you generate the SOC config and you close. Now, what, what is uh, getting generated after this step? There is an SOC gen folder that got generated. And inside this folder, you have an ESP folder. Here, there is an hidden file called ESP config. And if you open this file, you see that now we don't have the default configuration that I showed you earlier, but there is new configuration. It's exactly what we configured in the GUI. So you see some accelerators, one CPU tile, memory tile, IO tile and even some empty tiles. In addition to these, um, for RISC V processors, you have automatically generated a device tree. I don't know if all of you are, are, uh, are knowledgeable about this, uh, these things, but the device tree is fully generated and all the accelerators appear as distinct devices in the device tree. You see also the NVDLA ones and structures. Uh, finally, there's also a little bit of RTL being generated, like the SOC map, the SOC map with the HD. Uh, here you have all the partitioning of the address space and things like that, the mapping of, of the memory map yet registers and so on. All, all those things are generated autom <clears throat> automatically. Now, before uh, doing anything else with this SOC, we are gonna directly go and generate this, uh, the configuration for a different SOC. Um, let's move in a different FPGA folder so we don't overwrite what we have just done. And you can move into the VCU 128 FPGA. This is a very similar FPGA and it uses the same FPGA technology, it's a Virtex Ultra Scale Plus. So the accelerator that Paolo generated for the VCU 118 can be used also for this one. In fact, when you look at the generated accelerators in the tech folder, you see that we are dividing the generated accelerators by FPGA technology or ASIC technology. Uh, and so both 118 and 128 boards are going to point to this folder. Okay, back to the GUI. We we moved into the 118 folder, and just like before, we configure. Going to follow again 
the, the guide on the steps. Actually, this one, I had already uh, prepared it, but I'll show you all the things that I modified anyways. So Leon 3 processor, and you see that when you choose the Leon 3 processors, then you may have a different list of accelerators because this is only uh, seeing the accelerators that have a 32-bit VMA interface. And so NVDLA, for example, it's not visible. And you have your sub-accelerator automatically detected and the FFT that we generated. We do a three by three. We enable the cache hierarchy and we choose the system very low implementation. If you choose the system C implementation, that's totally fine, but everything is in the, uh, the tutorials in the documentation of ESP. What you need to do is to run high level synthesis also for uh, the system C caches because if they are in system C and this step will generate the RTL. Uh, we do system Verilog, we have four CPUs, and also for this experiment, we are adding an optional local private cache in the accelerator tiles. Um, and this is, this is needed when we want to do. Uh, full coherence with a private cache. And you generate your SSC configuration and you close. Of course, I didn't mention, but the sizes of the caches are configurable as well. So at this, at this point, at design time, you can choose. And some of the monitors that Joseph showed uh, for performance monitors are also available here. These checkboxes are for when you want to use the monitor and watch them from the GUI on the host machine, which is the second demo that Joseph showed. The first set of hardware monitors are always present. It's not a configuration option. OK, saving this one. Now we created the SOCs. There's one more step that you can do. And normally, this step is done implicitly when you proceed with RTL simulation or FPGA prototyping, but you can also launch it separately. And it's called make socket gen. Make socket gen is finding the accelerators that you have in your tech folder, which means the accelerators for which you ran high level synthesis. And it's generating in a socket gen folder. It's automatically generating some wrapper for them. So all that you see here is RTL generated based on your choices in the GUI. And for example, you can see that there is a wrapper for the sub accelerator generated by Paolo. And all of this is automatically generated. And this is adding the socket around the accelerator. And so, for example, if you allocate the L2 cache, this is the instantiation. This is the DMA. And actually, on top, it was the RTL implementation of the accelerator. And this is the instantiation. So this is generated code. OK, up to this point, I, I saw uh, also a message from some of you earlier. From this point on, yeah, you need some tools. These tend to be commonly available tools in academia, but maybe not. Uh, in any case, this part, we, we are going to show it as a demo for you also because, of course, some of the steps like Generating an FPGA bitstream can take an hour, two hours, or even more, depending on the FPGA you target. So we already pre-generated everything, and, and I'm going to show you uh, all the steps in the form of a demo. So I'm moving back into this terminal, and I have a different folder that I prepared where I already generated the bit string. OK, we're going to do RTL simulation and FPGA prototyping. Now, 
uh, for RTL simulation, uh, if you try to simulate uh, a system as big as the one that we designed, it will take several minutes just to run uh, the, simula the simulation of a bare metal test that uh, tests the accelerator. So I'm going to do a slightly, a slightly smaller design to show you the full system simulation. Although on FPGA, we will test the, the full system. So we can do your your new accelerator and your, this is a very minimal system so that the RTL simulation will be a bit faster. Okay, how do you do RTL simulation of the full SOC with DSP? This is as, as simple as doing make sim. Make sim is going to use model sim with the NC sim you use inside it. And with XMC, you use Cilium. Uh, these are the uh, RTL simulation tools that we support at the moment. Uh, as I said earlier, we welcome contributions that add support for more, more stuff. So um, for this demo, I'm going to go with the model sim. Now, if you just do make sim, uh, the simulation is running a simple bare metal program on the processor in the system that we designed. This simple bare metal program is something default. And we have it here in this sys-test application. As you can see, it's just an LO from ESP. This is already a very good test with your debugging stuff. Uh, in this case, though, we, want, we don't want to use the default bare metal program. We want to use the program that is testing our accelerator. So we go. We are going to point to that program, which, as you remember, it was in soft build, Ariane, bare metal, and then substratus X. This is the bare metal we compiled uh, a while ago. And then you just launch. This is compiling all the RTL and then launching model sim. Uh, this is all in batch mode. If you want to use the GUI, you just add dash GUI. Uh, to the to the sim command, so make sim dash GUI. Once you're in, you can just do run all, and this is going to run the simulation. Uh, the system is small, so it's going to be faster, but still a uh, few minutes. So I'm going to come back to this later, and in the meantime, uh, get started with the FPGA prototyping. Now. For FPGA prototyping, you need to generate an FPGA bit screen. What you do uh, after configuring the GUI is running make vivado sim. This is generating the, the bit stream, which I already pre generated, and you can see it's here, and automatically ESP adds a link to it in the design folder. Sometimes when we are debugging uh, and we want to add uh, the Vivado ILAs, the, the probes for debugging, it's useful to use the GUI. So the make Vivado GUI command is creating the same project, the same Vivado project as make Vivado sim, but this is also this is opening the GUI and then you can add the debug probes and then do synthesis and implementation yourself. Uh, manually in the GUI, directly from the GUI. Once your big stream is ready, and we have already compiled the software earlier, uh, you're ready to program the FPGA and basically uh, upload the bit stream on the FPGA. The command for that is make FPGA program. Now, I'm going to launch this in a second, but I want to show you a couple of environment variables that you might need to set if your FPGA is not directly connected to your machine, but maybe it's connected to a server or some other machine. In the local make file of the design folder, you can find a few variables. These are the ones needed uh, for programming the FPGA. And the default is an FPGA connected to localhost, which means connected to your uh, machine. If your FPGA is connected to some other uh, server, you can put here the IP or the DNS of the server. 
and then you can specify the hardware server port that you want to use. So this is to say the default, uh, you don't need to do anything, but we, with ESP, we have the infrastructure for uh, allowing you to have the FPGA uh, used remotely. Similarly, there's something that is more for the software part of things. Um, you can connect to the UART of a remote machine. This SSH is for connecting to the Linux instance running on the FPGA. And you may want to specify something if your if your uh, FPGA is, is on a different network. So you may need some extra information. And then finally, this is probably the more important, the most important. The ESP link is the tool that transfer the uh, Linux image or the bare metal program that you want to run from your host machine to the ESP instance running on FPGA. And this apps happens through Ethernet. And so if, uh, again, your FPGA is remotely connected to some other router or some other network, you may want to play with this. All of this is explained in the ESP website, but I just wanted you to be aware of. In the default case, you need to do nothing, but just be aware that you can play with this if your FPGA is remote. Uh, I already sourced all of, all of those uh, variables in my case because the FPGA I'm using is very remote. I have various levels of indirections. And I'm going to uh, program the FPGA, as I was saying, make FPGA program. In the meantime, I also want to connect to the UART of that FPGA. Uh, ESP has a command called make UART that will connect you uh, directly through a tool called Socket. Uh, in this case, though, I'm just logged in into the machine actually connected to that FPGA, and I will launch uh, a tool called Minicom for connecting to the UR interface. There are many other tools that you can use. This is not uh, this is not the only one you can use. It's up to you. Okay, it's uh, programming. Almost done. Okay. Now, uh, on FPGA, I want to show you how to run bare metal programs, uh, the same type of programs that we uh, that you can run with full system RTL simulation. And then I will also show you uh, how to run Linux. To run the default bare metal program, that again is the hello from ESP, you just need to do make FPGA run. As, you, as I mentioned, this is using the ESP link tool, is transferring the binary of the bare metal program and of the bootloader. And in your Minicom, you can see that the ESP SOC on FPGA has printed a lot from ESP. Exactly like before, you may also point to a specific bare metal program that you want to run. And let's run the one that, that you guys generated. This is for the sub accelerator. So, and, and you can see what the default per metal program automatically generated earlier is doing. It's finding out, first of all, that there are two instances of your accelerator, not just one, and it's testing both of them. Here you can see the test starting done and the validation passing. In this case, uh, sorry, in this case, the accelerator is running with non-coherent DMA. Uh, that's the default case because we didn't have, we don't have a cache hierarchy in the system. We have it in the second SOC, not in this one. Similarly, you can run the FFT test. getting copied over and it already printed. You can see in this case, we have three instances of FFT. All of them are, are found and they are all getting tested. When I say tested, it means the Ariane core is configuring them, invoking them, uh, and then validating the results. I'm gonna program the FPGA again, and then we're gonna move to um, testing with Linux. 
I will show you the Linux boot. Uh, and then we will test the same accelerators, but also the MBT lay accelerators. This is just taking a few seconds. Okay, for launching Linux, the command is slightly different than before, not just FPGA run, but FPGA run Linux. Now this, this time ESP link is transferring a quite larger file because it's the full Linux image. And we just need to wait a few seconds. Uh, this step has failed a couple of times because I'm working remotely and there's a, a lot of layers of interaction. It will take a few seconds. I disabled the loading bar so that there's less, less interactivity. Okay, it worked. And so, ah, okay, I had so. And so now Linux is booting with the Ariane core. Uh, this, is, this is the step, the, the, the terminal was stopped at the moment. That step is when the root file system gets unpacked. So it always stops there for a few seconds. Uh, you see, uh, there are a couple of things to notice. Let me go back up. There is uh, an internet IP registered. Register, this means that you can access your uh, ESP instance through, for example, SSH or SCP uh, because it has Ethernet and there is a, a registered IP. Uh, also, uh, automatically, the Linux running on ESP, it's loading and registering the device drivers of the accelerators. So, this is a core device driver of ESP for the accelerator memory allocation. Then you, you can see three Stratus accelerators, two NVDLA accelerators. You see the prints are different because as I said, for, for third party accelerators, we try to use their own software, not ours. And then uh, substratus two instances. Here is the full list of device drivers in the root file system for all the ESP accelerators. Uh, but only the accelerators that are present, of course, are getting a, a register. When you log in with the root and that password is OpenESP, uh, if you're curious, you can go into dev and search for, wait, ls. And search for your accelerator, the substratus, and you see that two devices have been registered. Uh, if you want to see the, uh, whenever you see this print, uh, we allow the kernel prints with the timing on the terminal. So that's just a, a print from the kernel. And now I listed all the devices. And FFT, you can see there's three of them and so on. Now let's first test the sub and FFT accelerators. The applications were automatically copied in the root file system at this location. And we're going to run the default application. In this case, the application is written, the default application is written in a way uh, that it tests only the instance zero of your accelerator. Uh, if you remember in bare metal, instead it's finding all of them and testing all of them. You can clearly modify the application as you like. And then we have the FFT application also testing the instance zero. Uh, in this case, we, this SOC, we have also two NVDLA accelerators. For the third part accelerators, there's a folder specific to each accelerator inside the root. And here we have the NVDLA runtime and we, we also automatically copy over something to test it. So this is uh, an NVDLA loadable, which contains the, the network, the weights, basically the topology of the network and the weights. And we can specify an input image. And also we did patch this driver to allow to run more than a single 
instance in parallel. So in this case, I'm just gonna run two apps doing the same thing, but on uh, different instances of NVDLA. Uh, in this case, all the debug prints of NVDLA are enabled. Uh, in, the, in our third party accelerator guide, you can see that if you set verbose equal to zero when you compile NVDLA, you do verbose equal zero make and the NVDLA, it's removing all the debug prints and therefore the execution time will make more sense. Now the execution time is basically printing, recording printing. Uh, one other thing that you can do, as I mentioned earlier, now we have the ESP instance running on FPGA. From any host machine, you can do make SSH and you SSH into that instance. This is very uh, useful. And as you can see, we have the NVDLA test. So instead of working inside Minicom, like I did, you can just SSH. And this is also useful because you can use SCP or you can even use SCP from inside Minicom to copy over some files. So having this internet, sorry, this internet connection can be very, very useful. Uh, okay, I'm probably almost out of time. I just want to show you a couple of things about the other SOC that, that we designed. So this was the first three Stratus accelerators, two sub and two MV and VDLA. And in this case, we go with a different processor. At the moment, ESP has three options supported. Uh, hopefully, we will have more, even more options soon. And three FFT accelerators. So this is, again, a demo about FFT, which we're using as a recurrent example in, in this tutorial. Also in this case, I prepared a folder where I already generated the bit string, which if you remember is done with make without sin. You can see the bit stream here. I already sourced all the environment variables as we previously discussed, and I'm ready to program the FPGA with this new bit stream. In this case, uh, aside from showing the default uh, test applications generated by ESP, I also want to show you uh, an interesting example that is a little bit different. And I'll show you the, the code for that. And it's actually pushed in the ESP repo. So if you go to, sorry, yeah, soft common, soft common apps examples multi FFT. This is a, a test application using three FFT accelerators. If we open the, the actual application beside the valid data validation and data initialization, we can see something similar to what you see with Joseph. So we have the ESP alloc for allocating some data. Then we do a first invocation of a single FFT working non-coherent with non-coherent mode, only one accelerator. Then we do a second invocation, one accelerator with LLC coherent mode. And finally, with the fully coherent mode, which requires a local cache. And then the interesting part is that Again, simply with one ESP run call, we're going to invoke three accelerators working in parallel and all with different cache coherence modes. So the first one, fully coherent, LNC coherent, and non-coherent. This is showing how you can have uh, all these different coherences working at the same time. But also, uh, how with ESP run, you can invoke a lot of accelerators in parallel and as we will see in a second also in series because the next test instead is also doing only one ESP run call 
but it's invoking the three FFTs to work in series. So the output of one is going to be the input of the next one. And this is using a feature that we have in ESP. We call it accelerator point to point. It allows the uh, FFT, no, well, it allows any accelerator to communicate directly to another accelerator through the network on chip without going through memory. Normally, to share data, an accelerator would store to memory and then the other can read from memory. Uh, by communicating directly, they can also synchronize, synchronize uh, in a more finer grain uh, way. And this has shown a lot of performance improvements for the cases where it's applicable. Of course, you need a case where an, an accelerator can feed the data into another one. Okay, back to here, we program the FPGA. Launch Linux, let's see if it goes smooth also this time. And then I will just show you that uh, application and, and we're, we're done. Okay. So Linux is booting. Uh, notice that in this case, this is a multi-core. You see, we have four CPUs brought up for CPUs, let me go back up, brought up for CPUs, and you can see each CPU is going at 70, around 80 megahertz, so you see the Boko MIPS is four times that. Also in this case, we have some accelerators registered, one, two, and three here. In this case, we only have three FFTs. We log in the same way, root, and open ESP. If we launch top, uh, you can see also from here how Linux is really working on all the CPUs. Um, the examples application that I showed you, so it's here. And this is compiled by simply running make examples in the usual design folder. So if you see that app I was just showing is in soft common app examples. All the examples that are added here are compiled directly with that command. And before I actually run it, I want to say a little bit more about these configurations that we are passing to ESP run. The configurations are defined in a header file. Uh, they are, of course, specific to this case. And so I'll show you the, the two with three accelerators. There's one, the, the CFG, CFG parallel, has three accelerators, you see different accelerators, and also in this case, all three different accelerators. Now, for the point-to-point, -point, differently from uh, the case where they're working in parallel, we also have the point-to-point -point variables set. And so you can see how the first accelerator is stored, storing with point-to-point. -point. The second is as of one point-to-point -point source for receiving and storing then with point-to-point -point again. The last one receives from point-to-point, -point, but is storing normally, not with point-to-point. -point. Uh, this is all in the ESP repo, so you can take uh, a deeper look if you'd like. Uh, I'm going to run the application. It's interactive. It's running the first accelerator with non-coherent DMA. Uh, this is something we have already done earlier with the other tests. Then there's the LLC coherent DMA test. Different type of coherence, full coherent DMA. And finally, we do the concurrent execution of three accelerators with different coherences. And then the point-to-point -point test. And you see how similarly to what Joseph showed earlier, in this case, we're not actually printing all the monitor information, but the ESP API library is, is printing some execution times for each of the 
as a director. So I would say this is all from me. And I will pass the ball to Giuseppe, who's doing the who's doing a different design flow for accelerators with catapult HLS. Thank you, Davide. Thanks. So in uh, this fifth part section of the tutorial, we are going to analyze how to design and integrate C++ accelerator that we want to synthesize with Mentor Catapult HLS. And this is a new addition to our uh, ESP flow. In particular, during my presentation, I will go through a fast introduction of Catapult HLS. Uh, I will focus on a specific case study, the softmax function for machine learning. We, I will uh, stress a little about the concept of tightly coupled accelerator and loosely coupled accelerators. Uh, I will first describe how to design a ASP accelerator interface generically, and then how to instantiate that for Catapult HLS. And then we will go through the actual implementation. We have seen the interface. We will go through the actual implementation of the accelerator, and we are proposing a couple of architecture. A first one, simpler, is a single block architecture. A second one is a hierarchical block architecture. In the tutorial, I will illustrate how to design an accelerator with the C++ flow of Catapult HLS. Please note that Catapult HLS supports both C++ and System C as design specification languages. In the tutorial, I will describe some of the aspects of the C++ synthesis flow. With the ESP team, we are working on the Catapult HLS system C flow and the integration with the NVIDIA MatchLib. This tutorial is also available as end zone material on the ESP webpage. We choose the softmax function as a running example for the tutorial. In machine learning, softmax is a widely used activation function. You find it usually at the end of a deep neural network because it turns scores, floating point values, on arbitrary range into probabilities. The sum of the output values is 1. The softmax function outputs a vector that represents the probability distribution of a list of potential outcomes. For example, if you are running a neural network to classify animals, softmax returns the probability for the image to be a dog or a cat. You can also see the mathematical definition of softmax. For each value, we have the exponent of that value divided by the sum of exponent of all of the other values. We choose to leverage an open source implementation of the softmax, as it is provided by Mentor on hlslibs.org. This implementation uses piecewise linear approximation and algorithmic C data types, Mentor ACFIX. The input and output arguments of the function are parameterized so that the arithmetic can be performed at the desired fixed point precision. This allows the HLS designer to trade off among area and performance. During this tutorial, we will not explore the capabilities of HLS tool for the design space exploration, but we will focus on the accelerator interface, general structure and integration in ESP. As a preliminary example, this is how you would use the softmax function from Mentor in a generic design. I just want to highlight how the function takes as input arrays, output arrays, use ACFIX as data types, and that you can choose the precision of the input and output values. For example, here we are using ACFIX on words of 16 bits, 8 bits for the integer part. The first one has sign, the second one is without sign. We use truncation, and in case of overflow, we choose to saturate. You can find the material of this section on uh, the ESP webpage. The material contains the following code. The HLS project, that is the C++ source code, the testbench and the mentor catapult HLS script for the softmax accelerator, and the software, that is the application and the device driver for the softmax accelerator. 
Apart from minor code edits and console commands, you are not required to explicitly code, but we invite you to review the provided code and scripts when you will try it after the tutorial. We adopt some naming convention for accelerator that we design with catapult.hls. We use cxx underscore catapult suffix for the accelerator for the HLS C++ flow. We will use the underscore sysc underscore catapult suffix for the system C accelerator. The name uh, of the accelerator for this tutorial in particular is softmax underscore cxx underscore catapult. If you have correctly uncompressed the tutorial material, the files for the HLS project and the software application will be in the directories hardware and software. Before giving more details about accelerators in ASP and Catapult HLS, I want to introduce a classification for accelerator for heterogeneous system on chip. We can classify accelerator according to how they couple with the processor and the memory. There are essentially two main classes of accelerators, tightly coupled accelerators and loosely coupled accelerators. Tightly coupled accelerators sit in the CPU proximity. They usually share CPU resources, such as the register file and the memory management unit, and the caches. There is no overhead for the invocation, and they are virtually transparent to the software. On the other hand, they require an expansion of the, ISA, uh, of the ISA to include special instruction to manage their operation. This ISA expansion percolates to the software via a compiler or via low-level libraries. These kind of accelerators, tightly coupled accelerators, pose time enclosure challenges. The logic must meet the same constraints uh, of the CPU and may have limited portability across different designs at different CPUs. The second class of accelerator is the loosely coupled accelerator. Uh, they have a greater area budget. They cannot degrade the CPU performance. For loosely coupled accelerator, we are able to tailor the local memories, and in particular, we can move data among the accelerator, the private caches, the last level caches, and the main memory. The SP accelerators follow this second model. These accelerators are integrated in an ESP instance as devices that we control via Linux device drivers. The ESP accelerators operate on large data sets and they alternate computation phases with data transfer phases. Now let's consider first the interface of an ESP accelerator. The interface of an ESP accelerator has ports that are common across all of the supported HLS flows, as shown here in the figure. And in particular, there are some minor differences that are HLS tool dependent. We will see the details for Catapult HLS in the next slide. But first of all, let's see which port an accelerator, an ESP accelerator should have. To communicate with the CPU via memory map register, we have a conf info port. These encapsulate essentially the accelerator configuration, memory map registers. Then uh, to program the DMA controller, we have two ports, DMA read control and DMA write control. These encapsulate the DMA configuration. To transfer data from and to the main memory, we have DMA read channel and DMA write channel. Finally, there is a port to notify the task completion back to the software application, AC done. And this can be mapped either on a register or, on a, or to an interrupt. Given the previous overview of the interface of an ESP accelerator, we can see here the C++ code for the module interface when we run Catapult HLS. You can see that uh, uh, we are using Mentor AC channels and AC sync. The AC channels is a communication channel that allows the accelerator to transfer data to and from a top module. When combined with the HLS directive 
css.ioport.css in wait, it ensures that the data is properly synchronized at the interface via a latency insensitive protocol. Catapult adds the proper uh, shaking signals to the RTL netlist in form of read, valid, and data signal. While the AC sync port is a synchronization channel that Catapult offers for specifying standalone handshaking signals when a designer needs to control the synchronization directly. Essentially, there is no data transfer. And it is here combined with the directive IO port sync out valid. After HLS, this is how the interface looks like in RTL Verilog. You can recognize most of the ports that we have previously defined in C++. Besides the data channels that comes with the suffix underscore dat, you can notice the additional underscore ready and underscore valid channels that implement the latency insensitive protocols. We have seen how the ASP accelerator interface should be defined for catapult synthesis. And we have also seen the resulting RTL implementation of such an interface. Let's also observe the internal structure of the ESP accelerator. Let's remember that the accelerators in ESP are loosely coupled and that the accelerator execution consists of four phases. There is a configuration phase and after that the accelerator iterates and possibly pipelines load, compute and store phases. For Catapult HLS, we have defined two different coding styles. A first, more simple, uh, style is the single block architecture, where the phases run in a sequential way and are implemented in a single C++ function. Then we have defined a hierarchical block architecture coding style and in this case, the phases run concurrently one to the other. In particular, to add concurrency, we combine HLS directives with a recommended coding style, while still leaving everything in a C++ on time and single-threaded. The synchronization between the blocks will be added automatically during the synthesis process. And we will see these two co co uh, coding styles in a couple of slides. Finally, let me also stress the importance of private local memories in a ESP accelerator. In a VPLM, the accelerator keeps a copy of the data or a portion of the data from the main memory. The PLM becomes central for the design optimization process because they can be tailored to the needs of the designer. We have usually local memories to support each of the load, compute and store phases. Sometimes PLMs have to be implemented as circular buffers. In some other cases, they are ping-pong buffers. In most of the cases, the designer has to create PLMs with many ports to sustain the throughput of the accelerated logic. More in general, a properly tailored PLM reduces the latency and increases the throughput of the system. Let's consider the simplest style. The main characteristic of a single block architecture are the phases run in a sequential way and are implemented in a single C++ function. And the private local memories are defined locally to the C++ function. You can see here the pseudo code for the softmax function and we will see the C++ implementation in a minute. This is just to give you an overview of the implementation in a single slide. On the top, we have the interface that we have previously defined here, the signature of the function. And later on in the function, we define the local memories, the PLMs as arrays. Then we have the configuration phase where we read from the conf info port, the memory map register. In this specific case, we read the batch size of a softmax. That is the number of times we later on iterate over load, compute, and store. During the load phase, we configure the DMA controller with the offset in main memory and the amount of data we want to load. We use the DMA read control port for this. Once the DMA is programmed, we can start reading the DMA read channel and saving data in the PLM. 
For the compute phase, we leverage the mentor softmax. And once the computation is completed, there is a store phase. Similar to the load, we configure the DMA controller and then we start storing data back in the main memory. Here you can see the coding style that we have adopted for the hierarchical block architecture. The main characteristics are that the phases are coded as separate C++ functions. The PLMs are globally defined and shared among the functions. Note that Catapult offers the modeling construct AC channel to allow the users to directly model the data exchanged between blocks of a hierarchy. While in software, functions can exchange data via shared arrays of variables, this becomes problematic for HLS, since the synchronization of data exchanged between blocks must be inserted automatically by the synthesis tool. Because of the inherent complexity associated with this, Catapult offers the modeling construct AC channel to allow the users to directly model the data exchanged between blocks of hierarchy. Note that the user can use the AC channel to model both IO streaming and memory interfaces. Here at the function interface, we have the IO streaming. While here, later on, we are declaring the PLM as AC channel and those memories are passed as parameters to the load, compute and store functions. In addition to AC channel, in this coding style, we use AC sync for the synchronization of the processes and blocks. The AC sync are passed as well to the various function. And when all of the processes have completed, they synchronize via the synchronization primitive. Finally, at the end, we return the accelerator done signal. As array sizes become larger, it is typical to map them to memories during HLS because the area and power cost of mapping to register becomes prohibitive. In Catapult, the arrays, the term shared between hierarchical blocks, get automatically mapped in a ping-pong memory structure. This ping-pong memory structure consists of two or more memories that are written and read in a, such a way that the blocks can run concurrently. And this is useful and is one of the key aspects of the accelerator in ESP, being able to tailor the PLM to keep the maximum throughput of the accelerator. Finally, in addition to the above HLS directive, a coding style must be followed to ensure that extra memories are not inferred by error. First of all, you have to remember to encapsulate the shared array in a struct, and then a local struct with the package array should be declared to perform the memory operation, and this local struct is optimized away if the coding style is carefully followed. For example, in the load function, uh, when we transfer data from the main memory to the shared input PLM, we should declare a temporary version of the PLM, a local instance. We have to iterate over this local instance and read data from the DMA channel and only finally write the local instance back into the PLM. The same applies for the store phase where we read the output PLM into a temporary copy and use this copy to transfer back data in memory. In both the cases the temporary copy will be not present in the generated RTL and there would be only one shared memory structure between the top module and the sub-modules. So this was essentially this smaller section about Catapult HLS. We have a hands-on tutorial on the ESP webpage, and there are much more details in particular regarding how you really use Catapult HLS to design an accelerator in C++ for ESP. I think, thank you everyone. I pass the ball to the next in line. Yeah. So next we have one more uh, design flow for accelerators. Um, we, Giuseppe covered the C++ with Catapult. Uh, Paolo earlier covered the system C with Stratus. Now we see how to design accelerators with Keras, Python, Geronix using an open source tool called HLS4ML, um, of which Giuseppe is a contributor. And um, this is an example where there is a lot more automation 
because the accelerator is specified at, at a higher level in Keras Pythogenomics directly. From there, we go to a Vivado HLS implementation automatically, and that Vivado HLS implementation is integrated in ESP automatically. Also for this case, we have a recorded video, which is a, also an example of what you can find on our website in terms of um, tutorials. Hello, everyone. In this tutorial, I will show one of the ESP accelerator design and integration flows. This flow leverages a tool called HLS4ML that is able to automatically generate an accelerator starting from a Keras, PyTorch or Onyx model. With this flow, then ESP automatically integrates these HLS4ML accelerators into a full SOC and we will go all the way down to deploy the SOC on FPGA and test it. There's a written version of this guide as well on our website, as usual. Uh, make sure you read there what are the prerequisite tutorials and um, go over them before getting started with this one. You will also see that we provide some pre-built material so that you can try the experiments without having to go through all the steps uh, of the tutorial. Uh, mainly in this tutorial we will have a first part where we use HLS4ML to generate an accelerator. Uh, HLS4ML generates accelerators in C, C++ for the tool Xilinx Vivado HLS. And then in the second step we will move into ESP and with an interactive script we will import this accelerator generated by HLS4ML and we will automatically integrate it and test it into ESP. As a first step, we clone the ESP4ML repository. For the purpose of this tutorial, we will be using a Keras model already provided in this rep repository. So we can move in. You need to install the tool. I, I've already done it, so I'm not gonna run it, but this is the command. Then we move into the example models. We're not gonna build a new model ourselves. We're just gonna generate one here. You can see from Keras config that the default, the default um, model is a three layer. This is a three layer multi-layer perceptron. It's just three fully connected layers. In our case, we do want an input and an output. These are not provided. So we provide them on the written guide on the website. You can go on our website. You can go and download them there. The, we provide very short inputs and outputs. It's only with eight inputs and eight outputs. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna fetch them wherever you, you download them from. It's just these two files and you copy them into this Keras folder. Basically, we took some um, input and outputs from a branch of this HLS for ML repository and we just made them very little, very short. So now we are ready to convert the Keras model into a Vivado HLS accelerator. It's pretty fast. Now you see that you have a Vivado HLS project folder called My HLS Test. We are just gonna go inside and run We're going to run a um, C simulation of this uh, accelerator, only the C simulation. Running the C simulation generates this uh, C sim result log. Uh, which we're going to use because these are the results produced by the accelerator already quantized with the fixed point precision of this accelerator and we're going to use them to validate into ESP. Um, then this is it. So remember this, this path because ESP will need to import this path. I'm already going to copy it for later. Okay, now we can move into ESP. Here I already cloned it. 
you should go through the prerequisite guides, especially the setup guide to have uh, everything ready, the tool chain, the environment. Um, now to integrate an, uh, an HLS for ML accelerator, we are going to launch our... Uh, at this point, I just wanna uh, point out that as you can see the script should be the same that Paolo used in the beginning, but it's a different path because this is a slightly older video. We had some recent restructuring changes in the repo. Uh, so when you check the ESP videos on, online, there is sometimes a disclaimer saying that it's an older version and also it's saying which version of the repo. Um, the written guides are all up to date. Some of the videos have that disclaimer, so just FYI. Uh, pretty much everything is the same, just uh, some some files have changed names or position. For interactive script for generating accelerators. In this case, we're going to call the accelerator MLP three layers. Then we're going to choose the HLS for ML design flow. We're already in the ESP home, which is what I suggest. So for this, we keep the default. Here we can paste the path of the Vivado HLS project that we generated with HLS for ML. Here, uh, this is a three digit hexadecimal. It's an ID for your accelerator. Here, here you can really insert any number that doesn't overlap with other existing accelerators. In the written guide, for example, we say 194. The only limitation is that in decimal, this number should not be bigger than 1024. Okay, the data bit width of this accelerator can be found going into this parameters file. So this is the this is the data type of the accelerator. So it's 16 bits in total and six bits of integer part. So we could do 16 bits, but for the purpose of this tutorial, we do 32. So we're actually wasting some bits in this case. But as long as this number is bigger than the precision of the accelerator, it will work and you can choose between 8, 16, 32, and 64. Uh, as we saw a second ago, the fractional bits were 16 minus 6, so 10. Then we go back to this file and we can see that the first layer has 16 inputs and the last layer has five outputs. So input data size 16, Output data size 5. And going back one more time, as I was saying, those input and output files that we moved around, they got transformed into these T TB input features and TB output predictions. Each of them has have the same number of rows. And as you can see, it's eight rows. So we have eight inputs for the test bench. Now this is done. This is all you need to do. Your accelerator is fully integrated in ESP. And from this moment on, all the steps are the same as for uh, what we showed in other guides for system C accelerators or for C, C++ accelerators. Um, so as usual, you move into a design folder. For example, in this case, we choose the VCU 118. I have here a little script to uh, set, um, set the environment variables. You make sure you set them as described in the setup tutorial, in the setup guide. And now the first thing we do is we run the high level synthesis for the Vivado HLS accelerator that we just imported. So this Vivado HLS project. The Vivado HLS project is now, by the way, into accelerators, HLS for ML. You see there is a folder, MLP3 layers. 
which is which has been generated by our steps here all of these fall all of these things are generated by esp so test bench the scripts for uh, hls and simulation source files and this is an xml with some information needed by the system uh, here are some other files and instead this hls for ml folder is nothing but exactly the content of the original uh, my hls project so if you look at this content you see build project firmware if we go back to our project here you can see it's the same so this is just a copy and paste of the project inside of esp plus the addition of all these things for wrapping and interfacing the accelerator with the rest of the esp system so how do you run hls with esp you just type the name of the accelerator it will autocomplete and then hls you can see first that it ran the c simulation with those input files and output predictions that we um, moved around earlier and the test passed so you see how this script not only imported the accelerator but also added a test bench that works automatically now this take a while and for all of these steps that take a while i will just fast forward now what does the hls uh, step generate first of all the whole project is running in accelerators hls for ml name of your accelerator and there will be an hls work and then this is the technology vertex ultra scale plus in this case um, of your fpga so that's the vivado project then once the um, once vivado is done generated the rtl the rtl is placed in tech again the technology of the fpga you chose and then in accelerator mlp3 layers here you have two versions of the accelerator inside there you find the um, rtl Temple. here you see the generated rtl there are two versions because we uh, always generate the emitter with 32 bits and 64 bits because the 32 bits will be instantiated when you use the leon 3 processor and the 64 bits when you use the ariane processor um, now we see in a second so now the accelerator um, exists it's been generated and it's in very low we are going to configure an soc with the espx config command as i said here when you choose ariane or or leon it will change your option for the accelerator so here of course now we can find our new accelerator so for this tutorial i'm gonna just stop uh, the video here on the website you can see also the next steps about fpga prototyping but in the end all the accelerator design flows of esp converge to the same soc flow uh, for also rtl simulation and fpga prototyping so it would be <clears throat> pretty much the same as for the other uh, guides. So I'm gonna hand this back to Luca uh, just as a final summary of all the flows. This is a slightly different picture that you've seen before, but same idea. Uh, with ESP, you have flows for using uh, existing tools for designing accelerators. Uh, the goal of these flows is to help the accelerator design so that the designer only has to care about the computational part of the accelerator and not so much about how it gets integrated in esp what's the interface uh, what's the device driver the test applications so it's trying to relieve the designer from a lot of work uh, and something similar we do for third-party accelerators where we would really like to see 
a lot of new open source IPs and we, we would love to be able to integrate them easily. And as I said, everything converges into building the software, configuring an SOC, and then being able to evaluate it. Of course, we never mention it um, in these demos because it's not something we can show with the demo, but clearly one of the end goals after the FPGA prototyping or in parallel with the FPGA prototyping is targeting ASIC and so building real SOCs that you configured and designed with ESPs. So I will hand over to Luca, stop sharing. So he can tell us more about, more about ESP for teaching and then also wrap up. Yes, so thank you, Davide and everyone. Uh, I hope it's been uh, an interesting tutorial so far. So as you can see, we uh, have uh, um, built uh, uh, an infrastructure that, in our opinion, um, can help uh, to prototype a variety of SOC with a variety of uh, design flows. And the goal really is to um, promote research and uh, the open source hardware movement. So in that context, uh, let me uh, say, spend a few minutes just uh, in conclusion, tell you about also uh, teaching, which is uh, really an important aspect uh, to create the new generation of SOC designers, researchers, developers, entrepreneurs. So at Columbia, uh, we have uh, two courses uh, um, strongly related to ESP. Uh, system on chip platforms, uh, which is mentioned in this slide, is uh, um, a course that, uh, ah, before I go ahead, uh, just one more thing. Uh, we posted uh, on the chat um, the link to uh, a very brief questionnaire. Uh, it's just a few sentences on the tutorial uh, that um, is done uh, through, um, is a website is done through Google Form. Uh, is an, we don't collect the email. So if you will, uh, uh, if you want, uh, please uh, answer these questions uh, in the, in the next few minutes or right after the tutorial. Uh, that would help us to keep improving uh, the tutorial. Thank you very much. So we'll say about teaching. Um, uh, the, um, um, the System on Chip Platform course is a, a foundation course on the programming design and validation of System on Chip with emphasis on high performance embedded application. Now, we have offered it at Columbia now for almost 10 years. It's part of the uh, upper level uh, undergraduate uh, curriculum as well as of uh, the uh, master program in computer science and computer engineering, electrical engineering. The goals of the course are to master the hardware and software aspects of integrating heterogeneous components into a complete system, design new components that are reusable across different systems, product generation and implementation platforms, and evaluate design in a multi-objective optimization space. Uh, where typically you have conflicting objectives, performance versus uh, resources, cost areas, FPGA resources, and so forth. And uh, we also uh, wrote a paper uh, a couple of years ago at a workshop on computer architecture education, which describes in much more detail uh, the course. Here, what I show you to you is uh, what uh, our students um, can do at the end of the course after they uh, I've learned uh, the principle and the practice of SOC design. There is a strong emphasis on designing accelerators in a way that they are highly reusable. So the animation that you see on the right hand side here, I don't know if you notice on the top right corner, uh, days goes, go by. This year, uh, that was in for the fall 2015 semester when the students in the class were organizing teams and they were uh, competing in designing a hardware accelerator for a particular computer vision application. And each dot that appears there, is a new working uh, accelerator with a certain performance in terms of effective latency, which is number of clock cycle time clock period. So the smaller, the better. And area measured as equivalent lookup tables on FPGA. So again, the smaller, the better. So the closer you are to the origin, the better is your performance and the smaller is the number of resources that you spend. Of course, there is a trade-off there. So typically you are in a bio-objective optimization space and the best designs are the ones that are Pareto optimal in this context. And so these are the ones uh, identified by the triangle label as opposed to the square. And you can see that uh, over the span of about 20, 25 days, the various teams competed in uh, um, designing these accelerators. Now, one important point with respect to ESP, at the end, we had 11 Pareto optimal design uh, spanning 20, 26X in performance and 10X in area. 
You can take any one of these designs, which are very different in terms of internal logic and the number of clock cycles they need to execute the particular computer vision task. And again, you can take any one, a Pareto optimal, a non Pareto optimal, and plug it into a socket of an accelerator tile, and you are guaranteed that it will work functionally in a correct way, and it will be possible to execute uh, the, the function invoking it from software, no matter how the design has been optimized. And of course, your mileage may vary with respect to performance and area, but that's precisely the point, because in this way, you are designing a component for which you have many different implementations. And depending on the particular SOC that you are architecting, you may want to choose one implementation or the other. And you may remember that in the graphical user interface, when we have an accelerator tile, we can choose the particular implementation. So in this particular case, for instance, it would make sense to have in the library the 11 different implementations, which are Pareto optimal, and there will be 11 different choices for that component that then you can combine with other choices for other components. And ESP will take care of all the synchronization and communication. So the, over the years, we made this project more interesting. We com balance comp uh, uh, competitions in designing reusable components with collaboration. So for instance, we started by having half of the teams in the class uh, designing a discrete cosine transform, the other half described designing an, an inverse discrete cosine transform in such a way uh, that was very similar to what I showed you before when everybody was designing the same component. And in this case, however, people could then uh, choose uh, which particular uh, implementation available in the uh, uh, on in the library from the teams who are designing the other component and combine it with the one that they are designing and come and build together therefore in this way um and a, an impl a full implementation for the system what I, sh I should have said that what you see here this is a snapshot from a, a, a web page where there is we have an infrastructure that allows dynamically to track all the commits in the uh, git repository and therefore we uh, can share with the students the implementations as they are becoming available and so they can combine these so in this case you can see another thing uh, which is important with respect to esp you can you are guaranteed that any implementation of the dct will go into the equivalent of an accelerator tile and will be able to work with any other implementation of the IDCT. So again, you have a fast path to a functionally correct uh, system implementation and your mileage in terms of performance and cost may vary as you explore the design space. And we kept uh, um, improving this idea. And so more recently, we have had uh, um, teams uh, working on different aspects uh, of uh, a system which combine uh, a, a machine learning kernel neural networks with other computation vision uh, uh, tasks. In this case here, this, the slide shows particularly the neural network aspect. So uh, uh, here people could work on optimizing one particular layer of the neural network and, and so have a local, or if you will, component level this design space exploration where you, uh, where you uh, share, um, where you consider the trade-offs of area versus latency, and then uh, relying on a system uh, that, again, uh, allows people to see the uh, uh, effort uh, from the other teams uh, and choose uh, which other components to combine with the component that one particular team has designed and obtain a complete system level implementation. And in, at the system level, the design sp space exploration typically is done with different metrics. Area is still a metric or FPGA resources is a metric in terms of cost. But in terms of performance, maybe instead of minimizing latency, you want to maximize data processing throughput. And uh, you also have an aspect of accuracy for this particular application. So you have, let's say, uh, the, um, an optimization space which has three main objectives. And so you're looking really for a Pareto surface in that context. But again, uh, what is possible here is this form of uh, collaborative engineering where you uh, can combine components uh, with other components designed by other teams and made available in a library. And uh, you are guaranteed that through the uh, system of sockets and interconnect and latency sensitive protocols that you uh, can uh, quickly combine these components and obtain a functionally correct implementation rapidly. And then you can, of course, refine your design by improving um, different uh, parts of your system, either because you want to increase performance or reduce cost or both, and try to have, in fact, multiple implementation of the overall system. So things repeat in some certain of, in a certain fractal fashion, if you will. So this uh, uh, one final thing is that we have also developing, uh, we have been developing um, a more advanced course where instead uh, students focus on doing 
more research-oriented type of project and developing their own accelerator or application using ESP. For this, if you go on the ESP website under the um, resources, uh, I believe you have the teaching um, uh, uh, page which provides some information on how uh, you could, if you want, uh, organize um, at least a, a segment of a course around uh, projects based on the uh, ESP open source uh, infrastructure that we have presented to you today. So in summary, uh, a few final words. Uh, we contribute ESP to the open source hardware community in order to uh, support the realization of more scalable architecture for system on chip that integrate uh, more heterogeneous components thanks to a more flexible design methodology which accommodates different specification languages and design flows. ESP was conceived as a heterogeneous integration platform from the start and has been tested through years of teaching at Columbia University. And so we hope you enjoyed our tutorial. We invite you to use ESP for your projects, for your uh, teaching and education, and to contribute to, to ESP if you want. Thank you very much for your attention. On the website, uh, you can find uh, all publication, more hands-on tutorial on particular part of the system. And the ESP team, again, thanks you.